All right, it's Wednesday. How's everybody doing out there? It's vibrant time. Extremely excited. Of course, we got my partner in crime, Gabriel, here, ready to do whatever kind of slick dissident, split dissident, <laughs> bringing the wave and the weave. Yeah, and our excellent, excellent brother, Marty Leeds, is here to hang out with us tonight from the Gnostic Church and Academy of Lord Jesus Christ. Awesome, awesome Sunday sermons Marty's been doing. I have it's like my body wants it <laughs> even if i stay up late the night before i always wake up in time for the 9 a.m central live streams marty's been doing really excellent work super fun to get that once a week like uh download of biblical syncretism and anagogical astrotheology in particular he's just put together a documentary that's a compilation of some of his greatest hits in terms of astrotheology of the book of mark or the uh the gospel of mark and it's so good that my mom even watched some of it with me. <laughs> so how are you doing, Marty? Thanks for being here. Good. Thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. Nice meeting you, by the way. Yeah, man. Pleasure. Pleasure. I'm I'm a huge fan. Always have been. And I, I'm just loving the way things have been going recently. Like, I'm with Chance. I'm in there in the chat on Sundays. And if I miss it, uh, I'm like one hour behind catching up. And it's good stuff, man. I love everything you do. I'm just glad you guys are tuning in. That's all. I appreciate it. I really do. I like genuinely appreciate when people tune in because I put a lot of time and effort into it and I fucking care about it. And it's my life's work. And so, you know, when you do that, especially doing it as long as I have, it's like, you know, you just, there's still something about you. You want people to show up, you know, there's part of you that's like, whatever. I understand this is not going to reach lots of people, but there's still part of you that wants, you know, anyway. So, so I, I know you always want to do more, do better, but I'll just let you know, you're doing really well. Just keep on the direction you're going. The right people are finding it. And then the waves and the ripples are further than, you know, the numbers that you get on YouTube are probably fake anyway. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't pay that much attention to it. I hardly ever, ever paid attention to the analytics, you know, as a numbers guy, I never gave a shit about the numbers. <laughs> Seriously. It's just, I was just kind of like, whatever, you know? So if it reaches, it reaches. And it's really not even about numbers. It's like, cause lots of people will view your stuff, but it's like, what, it, who is it sinking into? Who is actually spending that? Cause that's all I give a shit about. Who's actually learning this? Who's actually standing, you know, sitting back and be like, oh, wow, this is something else that I don't know about, you know? And that's the only people I give a shit about anymore. As far as like the people that show up at this you know, channel. So, you know? I'm only going to live so long and I have this information and I have to pass it on to as many people as I can. So the people that have the ears that want to hear, that's who I'm paying attention to. And the rest at this point, I really don't. Whatever. I, that's my, it's, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a quality over. Whatever, bro. You know, like, sorry. Quality over quantity all day, <laughs> man. In the first place. Like, don't. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm really stoked about is how much you're doing with writing music and books too. We didn't mention that, but you actually put out a new updated compilation of the Pi in the English Alphabet book trilogy. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to actually talk about this this Sunday. Um, but I'm basically what I've been doing for the last 10 years is, you know, genuine scientific work, but in esoterica. And in, in, in scientific work, it's like you basically, you know, in, in this metaphor, whatever, you put out paper A, and then paper A, you find out, oh, point a and C and E and F are dog shit, but G and B is really good. And then you write paper B and then you go through and you constantly go through this distillation process. It's really alchemical in that sense. And you try to get down to where you're, you know, getting the true meat, right? You're getting that, that, that solid hash at the bottom of <laughs> your filtering. And that's the, that's the good smoke that you want. And that's all I've been, that's a terrible metaphor. Anyway, but that's a, that's all I've been doing the last how many years is really trying to go through this in, in a totally explorative way and figure out what's true and what's not true and then distill that down to something that is palatable, digestible. And that's essentially what I did with volumes one through three in the new book. So I've just gone through and just with like fine tooth comb and was like, all right, what are the things that we explored? What are the things that didn't bear any fruit? What, what were the things that were dead fucking wrong and what's solid goddamn gold? Okay, let's talk about those now. And now, you know, and so it's a whole different journey than it was even five years ago where it was very exploratory. It's not even, I mean, it's still exploratory. Don't get me wrong. 
But now it's no, let's find out what's gold, what's absolutely true, that's 100% verifiable, that I can show it to anybody. Send, send me the best math professor you have, send them right fucking here. And I can show you things that you cannot deny. You will anyway. I know you will. But that's what I'm going for. So that's what the new book's all about. Awesome, man. You got any like specific examples of dog shit compared to gold? <laughs> oh, solar system stuff? Yeah, right. Um, I knew it was going to be like uh, stupid fake space stuff. In fact, one of the dog shit things I'm going to talk about specifically is at the Flattoberfest. Something I fell for, it was squaring the circle and, and um, basically, you know, uh, listening to USGS and like all of these, you know, people that were telling you about, you know, you know, sizes the earth and stuff like that, believing that without even questioning it and then presenting information that turned out to be completely incorrect. That opened doors to more conspiracies and more truth, which is beautiful. But at the end of the day, it was dog shit. It's wrong. You know, so how many people and I, I like try to pride myself in this. I'm going to go and say that's dead wrong. That's what you're supposed to do. That's the adult thing to do. That's the responsible thing to do. That's the scientific thing to do. You know, and in the truth community, you don't get enough of that. That's for sure. So, yeah. But then the gold things are things that, you know, things like some of the first stuff I ever did, even the numbers of heaven and earth, the mathematics of the hands. There's a tons of stuff there that have has not, you know, uh, you know, it's still just amazing. It's still completely quintessential to the work. And so that's, it's like, I don't know, it's so weird because for years, it's like, that's what I thought you were supposed to do. That's what I thought genuine scientific people did is they went in and they did this hell exploration, find out what was true and then, you know, focus on that. And then of course, in any honest pursuit, you're going to stumble like an idiot. You're going to scrape your knees. You're going to fall. You're going to bust an ankle and you're going to do stupid shit. That's part of the thing. And if you can't accept that, I'm sorry, but you're weak. I'm just going to say it. That's weak research. It's, it's, it's second rate. It's what it is. There's a lot of that in both sides of the aisle, you know, our type of community, the scientism cult are chock full of people. And I've been guilty of it before too, doing lazy or not really doing research. So somebody will come along and they'll have done research and it's really awesome. It's great research. And they come to a certain conclusion. That conclusion may or may not be right, but then it's like, there's this, the same way that people get stunned by, oh, they were on CNN. They're an expert. Mm -hmm. People in our community can have the same thing. Like, oh, I've heard him on a lot of podcasts. So everything he said is right. <laughs> it becomes like a, this is actually, I've been, I mean, sorry, I don't mean to sound like I'm all bitching here, but I've actually been insanely annoyed by that. But there's like, YouTube has created this like, cele like Marty Leeds is a celebrity. Get fucked. What are you talking about, dude? <laughs> are you nuts? Like, I, th I find that gross. I find it, I just do. I think it's stupid. It's like these people are worshiping celebrities like they would worship somebody in Hollywood. No, use your discernment and critical thinking skills and, and analysis on exactly what they're saying too. Chances are what they're saying is a lot of really good stuff. So, t you know, but at the same time, don't just be like, well, did you hear Marty Leeds said? Well, Marty Leeds has been dead wrong sometimes. And anybody that's honest with their whole pursuit, their trajectory, especially a spiritual one, if you're not saying that, you're just a liar, just a hundred percent, and and you don't deserve my ear anymore, period. You know. And there's a lot of those people, by the way. And as I've come to find over the years, a lot of the people that I respected, that I don't respect anymore, at all, because it was like, oh, you weren't really about getting to the heart of these matters. You were about your brand or your fucking ego or how many likes you got on Instagram. And I, I tell you what, as much as I it just talked about this is like, I care about that. I never pursued it. Not once. I never pursued any of this stuff for likes or shares or any of it. And God knows that. And I'll say this, that makes the difference between a real researcher and some slack jaw, half ass, you know, whatever YouTube channel. It's like, oh, this video got a bunch of views. Okay, was your video true? Was it true? Did you, can you go in two, three years later and be like, damn, that was good. Right? You know what I'm saying? And so to me, that's integrity, it's dignity, and that's what it's all about. The rest can, pardon my language, but get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fiery I sermons tonight. I genuinely feel that way and have felt that way for years. And the more and more I do this, the more and more... I don't know. 
strongly I feel about all that. Well, I appreciate that the real work looks like making actual stuff, <laughs> making actual books, uh, do it like real research is actually doing the work yourself. So I heard this from Topher Gardner, good buddy of mine, biocharisma. Mm -hmm. He, uh, made a really good point about how people, especially in my generation and younger are, they get this idea that if I just get sort of famous online, then that's the whole life goal. <laughs> like that's going to be all I need to do. And I mean, for me, that was sort of step one, not that I'm famous online, but step one was like, try to create a platform with my mission is to get voices like yours out there more. But now I'm in a position where I'm like, okay, how can I do the work for real myself? And how can I take what I'm doing off of screens and build something local that matters or do something that matters to the actual real world around me? <laughs> so that's kind of where I'm at right now is like, uh, how can, what's the next way to shift so I can go more in that direction? But Gabriel, you got any yeah. thoughts or uh, comments or questions from Marty here? Yeah, well, you know, I think a lot of that, you know, that celebrity fixation uh, it's a, it's a fascinating thing for me, you know, uh, chance has a great term. He calls it the Messiah. And I love that idea. Yeah. That like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That everybody, uh, they get caught up with somebody that's, they externalize the hierarchy basically, you know, and I always have always thought that was just foolishness until one day I had a, uh, I w used to work at whole foods in Boulder, Colorado. And one night I'm closing up the produce department there and one of my heroes comes walking in the store and something came up in me that I could not describe because I don't see, I don't have a lot of heroes uh, and something came up. I was overcome with excitement. And uh, who was the hero that walked in? Was it he's, Whoopi, uh, he's, Whoopi Goldberg or was, was it? Uh, 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 <laughs> Did you say fart Jew? <laughs> Sorry, we were talking about that earlier. Sorry. Sorry. No, it's a uh, it's a uh, capoeira instructor oh. who's uh, world renowned. He's a master of masters, and uh, and he's just perusing through my produce department with a couple other uh, uh, very advanced instructors by his side, who are just like hanging on his every word. So there's three just highly accomplished capoeira masters. Uh, walking through my casual workspace and I'm fumbling over my words and I approached them and, you know, did a brief introduction and I had to be brief because I had to go in the back room and compose myself. And I was like almost coming to tears and I was like embarrassed and confused. And I was like, what is this? What am I dealing with right now? What is this? <laughs> And so I did, I got myself together and I went back out and I reapproached him and I like, you know, uh, gifted him some like real dank mangoes, you know, and, you know, tried to honor his presence. And after he left, and I actually ended up meeting him many other times over the years. Uh, one other time I was at an, an event and I saw one of his students, he was talking to me, one, uh, me and my instructor one-on-one, -on -one, and I saw one of his students walk up behind him, and she just gave him a little massage on the shoulders, you know, as she passed by, but I watched her, because he could not see her. She was behind him. I watched her breathe him in, and then she walked away, and I realized, is this, is this part of his charisma? Is he rocking an air uh, you know, is there some cologne? Is he wearing like a Brazilian cologne that is like the secret to his success? He's got a pheromone or something. He's got, he does. He has some kind of pheromone. And so after she walked away, I like kind of nonchalantly took a sniff. I was like, wow, he's got a, he's got a real <laughs> pheromone vibe going on. And so there is really something to meeting somebody in person. Mm -hmm. And taking in their essence, you know, through the olfactory nerves uh, that is more powerful than just doing it online or seeing them on the big screen. You know, there's there's like another level of intimacy that's going on where, around that. So uh, uh, that's some of the thoughts that come to my mind is that, you know, all of the, the Messiah thing 
can really overwhelm people when it becomes like, you know, really in person one on one. I think uh, the, I think the biggest danger with that is when those people actually believe they're bullshit. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, and it doesn't say that the person doesn't have something to offer and, and, and is is giving and is educating or whatever it is. That's not what I'm saying. There's lots yeah. of people that have that. But when you start believing your own hype and you right. start that sort of, that gets you into cycle, especially if you have people following you around all the time, you're not living in a normal everyday existence. And I don't know, maybe it's just years and years of being like that. Yeah. Growing up very rebellious and listening to the misfits and skateboarding and faith no more. And, <laughs> and just, there was just always this thing that it's like, if you made it, chances are you got there from some shysty means you fucked people on the way up kind of thing or whatever. Now that isn't true for everybody, but it's true for a lot. Absolutely. You know? So, um, I just always had that in me where I was just kind of like, as soon as I saw that, I was like, no, nah, no, nah, get out of here. You know? So. Yeah, but that's cool you say that because in our conversation, our brief conversation, the two students next to him, in, back in the first time I met him in my in produce at Whole Foods, the one of his students was uh, asked me my name, <clears throat> and I just told him my name, and then in uh, he reciprocated by telling me his Capoeira name, which is you know like Flying Eagle or something in, mm -hmm. in Portuguese. And I'm like, oh, cool. What does that mean? And, you know, it's all mystical. And uh, the master elbows him and he's like, don't do that. Don't do that. Tell him your name. And he's like, yeah, my name's Juan. I'm like, okay, okay, Juan. Nice to meet you. So he like knocked his own guy down for trying to play that, you know, high and mighty. My, my name is Endless Horizon. No, it's not. It's fucking Tanner. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be like uh, if, if the apostles, John and James, were like, we are born there, Jesus. And Jesus was like, no, no, your name is John. Your name yeah, is yeah. James. <laughs> exactly. Just because I call you the Thunder Brothers. That's, that's yeah, our that's thing. That's my thing. It's like <laughs> <laughs> but, Nick, okay, so this seems like a good way to talk about, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ thing. Because to me, I see the most harm of mainstream Christian dogma is falling into the messiah of the pure externalization of a savior, you know, can we speak on that and what makes it different in terms of like the way that you look at the Bible and teach out of your Academy? That shit's idol worship. It's plain and simple. It's idol worship. That's what it is. And someday all of those Christians are going to have to, and I know this is harsh words and people give me shit for all this, whatever, but someday those Christians are going to have to face that because that's exactly what it is. You're you working on fetishism that. too. It's where you're like, and there's you another you yep. forget what your ancestors meant by certain symbols. And so you start take worshiping the symbols as the thing. Yeah. Yep. Pretty much. Yep. Something that's supposed to be talking about something transcendental, you know, you're worshiping this, like whatever, uh, I don't know, a half-assed version of it or whatever it is. I don't know what you want to say, but um, I don't know. I don't, I think that's got to die. I really do. I think if there's any going to be some like next sort of world age or whatever it is, if Christianity is going to survive, it's going to have to deal with the esoteric aspect and the mystical aspect of it. There's so much, you know, there's so much, that all of these dark sayings and questions are all the answers are all found within esoterica. And most Christians can't, they, uh, their, their religion and <laughs> tradition and church has told them to stay far away from it. And once again, the, I guess this is just sort of the rebellious sort of person in me or whatever, but I'm going to go in and be like, well, I don't really give a shit what a bunch of people think and say is true and not true. What is actually true? That's what I want to know. And once I find that, then I'm going to share that. And that can't, you know, the Orthodox community and the all of those people, they, they shun astrology and numerology because they don't understand it. And they think Kabbalah is some this or this and that. And as I've come to find over the years, they have zero understanding what they're talking about. And I'm not saying that of ego whatsoever. I'm saying that because I didn't know what I was talking about either. And I had to go in and say, verily, verily, and humble myself and say, I don't know what this shit means, period. I'm going to put myself in a position to understand it, though. And so um, <sighs> what as far as far as I can tell, modern Christians have no idea what they're reading. Not a clue. Not a clue, not even the first inclination of what any of that book means, what it's supposed to mean, the messages that they're supposed to send, not one. There's a reason for that. 
And esoterica, if you get into the mystical literature, they'll tell you what that reason is. That's because Christianity is such a powerful a force of good. And it's been under extreme attack for many, many moons. And there's so many people out there that I'd love to talk to about this and just pick up some of those esoteric books that are on my bookshelf and read right from those fucking writers. But they're not having those conversations. They're not talking to me about that. Okay, fine. Then go worship your idol and see where that leads you. <laughs> hey, it's a rant show, right? I'm ranting. So what yeah, I know we're good. This exactly is all good. How I feel. That's how exactly I feel. If you're going to be that bad and you're going to trash people like myself who have dedicated, who's a, I'm a man of the cloth for Christ's sake. <laughs> you're going to trash me. You've married people. Yeah, counts. <laughs> exactly. But you know, you're going to trash me for presenting this stuff, but you're never going to be honest with, with any of it. It's just, it, it's just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to even bitch or anything like that, but it's a huge issue. And I see a bunch of people that are calling themselves men and true seekers and stuff like that. Act like a bunch of squirrely little bitches because they can't handle the fact that they might be wrong about their theology. Well, too bad, too bad. God's going to show you one way or the other. You figure it out here or you're going to have to figure it out up there. So which is it going to be? Well, even, you know, I start to wonder if maybe Christianity isn't going to be the thing in the next world age, but not that Christianity as what it is esoterically will go away, mm -hmm. but that the trappings of it, maybe the label will need to go and something new take its place because like there are church Fathers like uh, St. Augustine, for example, directly quotable saying things like what we presently call Christianity existed before there was a thing that we call Christianity. And it seems that in yeah. any age, it was never wanting except for the title that it currently has, you know. And so that I think is what is most helpful because then it lets you have a way more unified perspective on the people in the world and you're not just like my if you want to give one reason why the the mainstream dogma of christianity is not working is the splintering and denominationism you know if it was really if there was truth to it if it was an accurate assessment of the esoteric there would be it would be a unifying force you know it wouldn't be just continually splintering and fragmenting amen that's pretty much it. The, the fact that there's even denominations of Christianity is proof, is proof positive that those people have no idea what they're reading. They have no idea the true esoteric and, and the true meanings of the, the doctrines there. The fact that they're splitting up and these people are arguing with these people and they're reading the same book. That should tell you everything you need to know about the, the issues of modern Christianity. And so um, part of part of the fact that like, you know, I had, a, I had like a lot of... Um, affinity towards Christianity in, in this sense, because um, number one, my family was, you know, part of Christian and they had extended relatives and it, I grew up in the Midwest and that sort of thing. But getting back into it, I saw how rich it was. And then I realized I was like, okay, if I was going to like run a Christian church or whatever, there would be all of these people or called my church, Lord Jesus Christ or whatever. There'd be all these people that be like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, because they have these preconceived notions and what they understand Christianity to be. Well, I took it as an opportunity to say, well, how about we just go and bust all those fucking molds? How about we do that? How about I show people what Christianity is actually all about? And then if they, you know, and then that's going to help a renaissance. That's going to help a rebirth. That's going to help people that actually are going into those books and being like, I want to know what this stuff means and giving them assistance and aid in any way that I can. I'm, you know, that's what Christianity needs. Christianity actually needs to get tear, tore down in that sort of sense. The old guard needs to get tore down and be like, all right, let's, let's, you know, whatever, slaughter the sacred cow and find out what's actually true and good. And doing that has been unbelievable. As you can see, like going <laughs> into that book again and doing all the book of Mark and having all of these people ignore all of it and then making all of those inroads to that book is, I don't know, man. I never thought I'd even be doing it. It, it's such a good people really should check out the astro theology of the gospel of mark it is on the marty leads youtube channel i believe the uh, url is youtube.com slash c slash marty leads live but there's a link to it in the description here i was it, it's so well done okay i've looked for astro theology documentaries for years 
you know, I've wanted to find something that was so concise and well put together and accept, but accessible, but also still detailed enough to paint the big picture. Well, that I could like, you know, show my parents. And I was telling you that before we came on the air that I actually last Sunday watched a good segment of that with my mom and dad <laughs> while we were having dinner and they were like fascinated by it. They were into it. And that to me is, you know, just to give it time. You know, things like that will uh, exist forever. That, uh, that documentary will be out there forever. It's going to be a slow burn in terms of how, many heads you turn towards a different view of the scriptures that actually <laughs> you know, gets them in touch with what's going on in nature. I love the documentary. You get a really good sense of the story that's in the stars and how it also pertains to some other types of mythology, showing you that the New Testament is based really, really heavily on Greek mythology and just sort of given different names. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, you make zeitgeist look like child's play. That's what I'm saying. Oh, that was my first introduction to it. Thank you, guys. I, I thank you. Like, I mean, okay. basically everything you're saying is what I was going for. So, thank you for saying that. I really appreciate it. I really do. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought it was essentially a zeitgeist too kind of thing. Not as that you know, but basically um, An, a version that didn't turn to communism after they hooked you in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Is that guy pretty like, common? They have no ulterior motive at all, other than to be like, "Here, here's a bunch of information." I'm not trying to be like, "Now you need to sign up and you know be a socialist or some shit." But um, yeah, thank you. That's all. I mean, I, I I basically try to show that look, all these things that you think about, and, and as far as I could tell, there's nobody that I know of at least living today. Now there's lots of esoteric authors and things like that, that I've studied in the past that would talk all day long about this shit. But as far as modern researchers that would go that in depth, I don't know anybody. So, I mean, I'm essentially just sort of filling a void there, you know, that's it. Um, it needs to be done. And I guess I'm the guy to do it. But other than that, I mean, I'll, I'll just say this. And I always say this, it's like all glory to God, you know, I mean, in, in, I genuinely, genuinely mean that, you know, like when I do, when I do the Bible studies and I go and actually uh, put those Sunday sermons together, I basically just get into a state of receiving. And I don't know how else to ex explain that. And I don't care if anybody doesn't understand that. I don't give a shit anymore. And to be honest, um, that's what it is. And that's what it, that's what it comes out as. And here it is. So, and that's a fantastic thing to, to be a part of. I'll say that. I definitely know other researchers that do a good job explaining astrotheology, like my buddy Dylan Sicoccio, his books are very, mm -hmm. very good at that type of thing, especially he has a great section telling you the whole 12 labors of Hercules mm -hmm. metaphor for each of the zodiac signs. But so there, there's other I've been learning from great people for a while, yourself included, but that documentary does. What I like about it is that it's just the book of Mark. And so you're going through sort of a linear story, but seeing how much more story is to the whole story. And that is really cool. I hope you do more, like <laughs> more astrotheology of certain Bible chapters would be cool. I have, I mean, as of right now, I have every intention of doing that, except with Revelation. Oh, I, that's the needed so bad. People are like, I wish that someone had told me the astrotheology of the book of Revelation, but when I was reading the Left Behind novels as a teenager and thinking oh, yeah. like, this is going to be me when I'm a grown up because it's going to happen. <laughs> well, it's so funny that like basically yet another, uh, I mean, it basically says so much about Christianity and the fact that you have all these denominations of people all over the world that read a book. And then if you ask them about Revelation, they don't have a God dang clue about what any of it means to the point that orthodox people and i'd i'd heard this i didn't even i didn't actually think it was even true until they reiterated it that orthodox the orthodox people they don't even read the chapter of revelation in church at all because admittedly they don't know what it means all i have to say is are you fucking kidding me is that really your position you're a church that thinks that they're the one line from christ and then you say what does revelation mean? Oh, we don't read it because we don't have a clue. Well, like, you know what? You know who does have a clue? A whole shitload of esoteric authors that none of those people are reading. 
None of them. They're dismissing them. They're they're not being honest with what's being said. They're being completely um, ir irrational about any of the subjects that are being brought up about them. They're never going to go into Freemasonic literature. They're scared shitless to go into Freemasonic literature. They're scared shitless. Be scared. Go ahead. All of the things that give them the inroads to understand their Bible, they reject wholeheartedly. So the revelation thing to me is it's a litmus test is what it is. If you're saying that you're a church and you can't even touch that, you can't even give any inroads as to what those things mean, you failed. You failed. And Marty Leeds is here to tell you that. And not only have you failed, I'm going to pick up the slack for you guys. If that sounds egotistical, you know what? It's not coming from a place of ego. It's not coming from a place of, look how right I am and look how smart I am. No, I dedicated my life to it. Just like a fucking, you know, guy that goes and fix your plumbing in your house has dedicated himself to plumbing for years. And so what do you do? Well, that's a professional. I'm going to pay him because he's going to know in. And I know that my shit's not going to flow all over my subfloor. You go to, a, you know, that sort of thing. And so I don't know, like, um, I find it, you know, especially getting into Christianity over these years and then finding all this stuff out, not only knowing it, it's like growing up with it, but then finding it out over the years that literally these churches have no clue. Well, if you don't, then you're leading people astray. And that's exactly what's happening. And so it needs to be said. It needs to be spoken. It needs to be. And those people need to hear it. And if they can't handle it, well, too bad. That's just like any other truth that they can't handle. The earth's flat. Can't handle that. Too bad. You know, there's some you can see too far. People have been trained to like ignore their actual senses. It's bizarre. I had a whole group of people that I was that I that I actually cared for very deeply, respected and was friends with. And as soon as I became a flat earther, I lost all of them pretty much overnight. And these were all truth seekers. Yeah. See, we have a nice <laughs> like, cultivated community here where we can stay friends even if we haven't come to the same conclusions about things. <laughs> I really appreciate that about, uh, you know, there are some variety of perspectives, but all with the same intention. Marty, though, I'm going to bring up a star chart in somebody's artwork. Excuse the uh, fake space shuttle endeavor here. <laughs> <laughs> and Apollo 11, you know, corrupting <laughs> this star chart. But I thought it would be fun. You're good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought it would be fun to just pull this up, this artwork of the constellations that kind of brings them a little bit more to life. And, you know, people, probably a lot of people look at something like this and are not even yeah. sure what they're looking at. Or they're just, it's sort of like um, a jumble of images. But I figured if I pulled this up, you could point out a few stories that exist in mythology or in the Bible just by the proximity and the illustration of certain constellations just for fun. Like what jumps out at you? Any stories jump out from this picture? Well, I mean, oh, geez, I mean, there's 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 tons you could point to here. I mean, I don't even know where you want to go here, but, you know, it's like the one that I pointed out in the last. Um, yeah, I'll just zoom in on anything that you want. Oh, well, it's like he had the, the, the mouth of a lion and the feet of a bear and the leopard and it was the Draco gave him his power and his seat and great authority. This is a line right from Revelation, right? And, you know, Draco, um, Draco is the dragon. His power gave him a seat and great authority is the dragon. Um, the, the feet of a bear, that's Ursa Major. Mouth of a lion, that's Leo. Um, the leopard is camelopardalis, which is a camel and a leopard right there. It's a, it's a giraffe, but the, the etymology is literally camel and leopard. Of course, it makes sense because a leopard is spotted and a camel is in the fucking desert. So you put them together, you're going to get this idea of a giraffe. So here you have this story in which no Christian I've ever heard can make sense of other than Jay Dyer's terrible interpretation of it. Awful, God awful interpretation of it that makes sense of that verse in revelation whatsoever. Well, all you have to do is actually put star study to it. And it makes perfect sense. Ursa major is the feet of the pair. They get the, you had a leopard was, you know, camel to Pardalis, right? <clears throat> Mouth of a lion. That's Leo. And his dragon gave him his power and seat and great authority. That's Draco, the dragon that's constantly revolving around the pole star. Now, what's so funny about this is that if you actually do your study of classical works of literature and things like that, or as you, as you guys know, the, the Greek mythologies, this, there's not even a question that these things are based on the stars. 
it's you know if you read Ovid's Metamorphosis, you'll read you you'll hear of Boötes and you'll hear of all the, you know all of these constellations you hear of. They're literally giving. They're literally saying these Grecian gods are up here. That's there. It's not even it's not even a question at all. So all you have to do is take one hop and a skip and a jump to the Bible and say, is this are they doing the same thing that I don't know the Norse fucking did and the Egyptians did and the Grecians did and all of these other cultures that were giving these constellations gods and there's no question about it maybe that's what they're doing in the bible too that's sacrilegious to even say that's devil worship it's demonic it's heretical because the church says so the very churches that can't tell you a lick one lick of what revelation means nothing because they refuse to look up at god's canopy i do you know, I do sympathize with everybody because, for the fact that it's actually hard to see the stars right now. And I really wonder how that has impacted, in some psychological way, the disconnect between religion and astrology that is seems to be more of a blip and an aberration in our modern age than some kind of anything normal. Everything, everything that's good and holy and true and beautiful and divine and sacred is going to always be under attack. Always. This is what, this is what happens with masonry. This is why I get, I just, I mean, it just gets really tiring to be honest when people are like, ah, oh, masons, masons do it, stuff like that. You know, th th there's a long history of the masons being the scapegoat and blamed for every conspiracy under the sun because it's easy and lazy to do so. The masons even talk about it. They have a joke about it. They literally, I don't know anybody that talks about this, but there's literally a joke about it, right? And so when you have these organizations that actually do really good things, that actually help and make good men better and bring people to God, they're forever going to be under attack. There's a long history of it. Henry Ford talked about the fact that Zionism has infiltrated the church. Zionism has infiltrated the church. Henry Ford wrote that great book, International Jew. Good dude. That guy warned people, right? Why? Why is because because Christianity is a force for good. So that means they're going to destroy every every connection to astrology, every true meaning of the doctrine. Anytime that they can go in and manipulate and get some pastor to be a piece of shit, they're going to do that. Right. And so that's essentially what's going on. You know, and we've been and especially Christianity has been subjected to it for a very, very long time. Yeah. And yeah Esoteric Christianity and Freemasonry are not really different, even. I mean, those those Christians are like, yeah, Freemasons. Are, uh, I'm sorry. At this point, uh, you, you're. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be so harsh. Pardon my language, but you're an idiot. Pick up a book. I'm sorry. You know, it's like I thought for after doing this. I'm sorry. I'm bitching a lot. Sorry, guys. Love you. I've been doing this for ten years, and I thought for a, after a while that people would wake up to it. People be like, oh, maybe I was dead wrong about that. And I need to pick up a book and listen to actually what Martin Luther's saying. It's gotten worse. I think it's gotten worse. I really do. Like, it's like, I can't even, people will not even debate or have a conversation with me because I'll bring up these, these topics and they're scared shitless to talk about it. They're scared shitless of being dead wrong about the fact that they're calling the very people that are actually helping you understand the esoteric principles behind the Bible. Ah, there's the devil worship over there. Devil worshipers. Didn't you hear the Catholic Church? You know, the pedophiles. They didn't like the Masons. It's nuts. It's nuts. So where I think the community has done that thing of grabbing hold of an idea because it's spread around and it's become a dogma for truthers that everything is a Masonic plot. And it doesn't, it definitely doesn't help us to ignore one of the only sources of this particular type of esoteric information being available to us in our language. Right. And, uh, you, you can't judge organ, you can't judge a, a, what's the word, like a spiritual tradition by a few actors within it either, mm -hmm. or the, or the fact that someone can co-opt co symbols of masonry of, you know, it's like the all seeing eyes being said to be, an evil Illuminati or, you know, evil Freemason symbol when the symbol is what it is and what it means innately is the, the inner self, <laughs> the, the light of the divine spark within or the observer, which is spirit or which is God, the, 
the fact that everything has eyes, <laughs> everything has the sense of self and the quality of beingness, like that Jehovah itself is a word that was meant to be interpreted as a verb indicating <laughs> the same thing as the Tao, which yep. is the essence of existence that exists. And so with that all seeing eye, if we're just rejecting that symbol and calling it evil, in a sense, we're calling source evil we're calling our inner self evil it's really twisted and i think that yeah certain there are some <laughs> diabolicals out there that have done that bait and switch on us or implanted those ideas but then it's like it's never the it's never the person's fault who convinces you to do folly that you did the folly it's always your own fault for continuing the folly and you know no one's here telling people to go join a, a lodge or anything, but like definitely crack a book <laughs> and don't be afraid just because somebody has a, a name that some truther at some point told you that they were uh, a boogeyman. Mm -hmm. Right. One of the, th one of the craziest things that I, I, that I, I still find like upsetting is that you'll hear people say that sort of stuff was like, all oh, the all seeing eye of God is bad. And it's a Freemason symbol. No, it's not. It's not a Freemason symbol at all. If you understand what Freemasonry is, Freemasonry is a compendium and library of ancient symbols. They collect everything from Hindu to Taoism to freaking the Abrahamic faiths. They'll tell you that. They write books about it. They have encyclopedias that are specifically for that, to capture ancient knowledge that's spread out across the world. Then people that are uneducated come to it and they say, oh, that's a Masonic symbol. All seeing eye got... That's a Christian symbol, actually. The Christ, I mean, not that it's exclusively Christian, but Christian cathedrals and artwork that was surrounding Christ has specifically used the all-seeing eye of God. Where's the disconnect here? What's going on? What's happening? Oh, you're actually not dealing with people that are being rational and reasonable and analytical and actually go into source documentation to find out what's going on. What you have is conspiracy theory. Not truth-seeking. In a, in a, in a, and I mean that those two words, those six syllables and two words, whatever it is, in a very degradating way. It's conspiracy theory. It's not theorems. It's not proof. It's not here. Here's the, here's what this stuff actually means. And the, it's junk. It's garbage. And I don't know. It's weird because I come from that place and I come into a world, a, you know, online world, YouTube world, conspiracy world in which no one else does. You know, I was this, I was a scholar of symbols and comparative mythology and religion, and I studied the mysteries. And then I come into a world in which everybody's like, oh, yeah, the, the, those Masons over there, didn't you know that they were the ones that went to the moon? I'm like, oh, yeah, did they really look happy when they got back from the moon? Look at those. Go look at it again. Those people, there's like the Masons, they're at the bottom of it. Did those guys look like they just got fucking duped when they got back from the moon? Did they look happy about screwing over the entire world and lying to them? No, they did not. But what did you all do? Masons. So my position is this, after once again doing this a decade, I'll just say this, if it's a little harsh, like I said, I'm kind of in that mood this morning. Too freaking bad. Shame on you. Shame on you because you're shitting on something that's sacred, divine, that actually leads you to a, a genuine understanding of the Holy Bible. And you shit on it the whole time. And then when somebody like myself comes along and say, let's have an honest conversation about this, guys. Come on, let's open up. Come on, guys. Does it happen? Chance, besides you, this conversation right now, you know who I've had a conversation about this specific subject with about? One other person in 10 fucking years. I don't know what to say other than I'm not impressed with this community anymore. I'm just not. I really, and that sounds like bitching and stuff. I don't, I'm probably losing subs here. <laughs> I, don't I don't care because it's really upsetting. It really is. It's like, please, please, just let's talk about this. Let's be adults. No. Okay. Well, my thing I is, I learned a long I time that I was, ne it never helped me to blame others for my problems. It never saved me any grief to fear a boogeyman and pretend that it didn't exist and close my eyes and ears to whatever it was. And so that's where I'm at with it. I mean, in, in fact, <laughs> to even say like any group is this or that, you're stating fiction anyway. Mm -hmm. Groups are conceptual. They don't exist in nature. There's only individuals and individual actions. And then there's only your 
individual actions that you have any control over. So, I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't cases where we can make an accurate description about a certain group and say that this happened factually. But the point is, like, that's not getting us anywhere. What gets us somewhere is, regardless of the source, getting to the truth of things and then sharing and speaking that truth in a powerful way. Uh, Gabriel, I feel like you're on the edge of your seat. You need to speak up, I hope. Oh, well, I've been thinking about, uh, you know, I've seen uh, quite a few lodges have shut down over the past few years. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say three to five years. I've actually seen some very uh, well-established, prominent lodges shut down their doors. And now it's like a ghost town. Mm -hmm. And I've actually heard firsthand from uh, some Masons that they no longer will invite you in. Like you used to need an invite or somebody would tell you, give you the offer. They say, you know, some people say it's three times you'll get three offers, but they're not doing that anymore as though there's no longer the same uh, recruiting process. And that in fact, you have to seek them out. Uh, does that ring true to, does that, have you guys seen kind of the same thing in your areas or any of your, Masonic buddies confirming that? Well, as far as I know, they don't recruit anybody. It isn't to say that they won't have like a, a um, you know, like a dinner or something like that and say, hey, if you want to come by, but they don't actively recruit. They don't evangelize in that way at all. As far as every everything that I've been, everything I know about masonry is that. Right. I do they, that. they want you to ask the question yourself, right? Isn't that sort of one of the core philosophies of it is yeah. waiting yeah. for you to ask the question? Yeah, it's 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 all about self. It's all about autodidactic research. It's basically like just like Christ says, it's like you knock and you ask. And if you knock and you ask, then it shall be opened on to you. If you don't knock and you don't ask, then the the, the truth and the, the you know knowledge of God and all that stuff is will forever remain closed to you. And that's the whole thing about masonry. So the core of it is, yeah, you know, you, you're supposed to ask. I do know this membership is way down. And there's lots of people out there like the RV truths of the world be like, yeah, that's a good thing. No, it's not. It's an awful thing. It's terrible. It's, you know, and so it just I, means I, less people are learning the esoteric stuff, which is a quick way to lose it in a few generations. Yes, yes, for sure. Um, that said, I will also give even I would say even a harsher criticism than I do to Christianity sometimes about masonry is that they have lost their way as well, that they are not doing what they are not being that lighthouse on the horizon that they should be for the esoteric truths that they're intended to be. In fact, my buddy Amor, he was a, you know, Mason down in Madison or Oregon down there, wherever. And they were all libtarded. hearted. They were all masked up and be like, yeah, January 6th and shit. And it's like, you know, whatever. And he literally went on um, the Zoom call because they weren't meeting because of COVID. I'm like, are you guys nuts? It proves that whatever masonry is, it's it's a it's dead in, you know, in that lodge. Right. And he, he anyway, he did the Zoom meeting where it was like the head, one of the heads of masonry. And he was talking about how there's been some new signups and that some of these new signups are looking for um, that they're getting into it because of, you know, quote unquote, secret knowledge, occult, hidden knowledge. And the guy who was like one of the head master masons, he, he poo pooed it. He literally was on a Zoom meeting and he's just like, yeah, that's not what masonry is about at all. And Amor left because of it. he's like. Are you nuts? That's the core of masonry. So the point is, is that masonry, just like the churches, has gone so far adrift from its noble, true intentions. And that's why I never joined masonry, because reading Masonic literature and actually studying it and actually taking it seriously, I was like, well, they're they're falling victim to the same thing that the church is. Just like you're not going to go down to the church and learn about the astrology of Mark or wherever, right? Because they're so far away from it. Once again, why is that? And you don't have to take any oaths, which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. The the uh, that's a whole different conversation because the those oaths are fucking amazing. You know, that's another thing. But um, when you when you get into them, especially some of like the say for even the Masonic stuff, when you get into like um, not it's even some of the Masonic stuff, like the Swedish stuff, it's like you actually take an oath to do, to defend uh, Christianity and the Holy Bible. Like you, like you're literally a warrior of Christ. Your oath is to be a warrior of Christ. It's great. 
So I actually read it when live streams and then people were like, no, that's not true. Like you, you get the PDF if you want. You don't have to believe me. You could just go and do two minutes worth of research, but I don't know, you know, whatever. That's another thing we should tell people about your website. You know, give them your website real quick. Just GnosticAcademy.org. That's right. It used to be Marty Leeds 33, but now it's GnosticAcademy.org. Does the old URL still work just in case people still look for it? I think it does. Yes, I, I believe it still does. It should send you to the new one. Well, you've got for people there that tithe and become a member, which is extremely not expensive, by the way. No, I keep it cheap and I have every intention of keeping it cheap. Yeah, I appreciate the access to not only your own works as ebooks, but you have preserved quite a nice library of esoteric literature that is curated by you. So, you know, it's something worth getting into. And, you know, at this point, <laughs> uh, it occurred to me just like when I went on this rambling uh, <laughs> synchro synchronistic exploration yesterday where I got myself intentionally lost and tried to see if I could wind up learning something about the area I lived that I didn't know. And, you know, having a better map of it in my mind as well, maybe a bit better way to navigate uh, mentally. I realized just how quickly local lore, just in small localities, is completely evaporating because people look for information online now. And then a lot of that stuff was passed down orally. And when people had less things to do, like watch 10 year olds twerking on Netflix or whatever they do on that nowadays. Uh, they would, you know, they would go out and look for weird stuff in their area. My dad was telling me about some petroglyphs he knows about near here that Jim. we started doing some Google searching for it. Nothing. There's no information about that. <laughs> you know, stuff is just getting totally buried and lost. And so the esoteric is another layer of that that is majorly at risk. So what are some of the books people can find on your uh, membership for, for joining your site that you think would be worth exploring that, you know, examples of some of the literature you've been talking about. Well, yeah, the PDFs, I mean, I haven't read all of them, but I know most of those authors, you know, so I've read a bunch of their pieces, but I mean, I've everybody from, you know, Steinman's to Ward to freaking Steiner's on there and Hall and Pike and, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch there. Um, as far as like, esoteric authors i mean i don't know like i i, I don't know what do you say i bit my what do i say bit my teeth what do you say what's the what's the phrase i'm thinking of anyway cutting um, your teeth thank you <laughs> <laughs> Maybe i just have another beer cutting my teeth on uh well hall was a big one i mean i probably listened to which was very striking to me because i i was early on especially getting the masonic stuff i had the inclination like a lot of people did first going in. I was like, are these the Satan worshipers? What's going on? They've got secrets and shit and handshakes. You know, that's that's a rational thing to your first inclination to be like, ow, that's some shady shit going on down there. So then one of the first guys I got into was Hall, and I was just awestruck about how much knowledge this fucking guy had. I had never heard anybody in contemporary world speak like that or know so much religion and comparative mythology he could speak eloquently about symbolism astrotheology philology ancient history you know uh, myths this guy could cover everything and i'd never heard anybody speak like that so then i ended up diving into hall with you know i probably read i don't know eight ten of his books or something like that and probably listened to i would say well over a hundred of his lectures over the years and the guy is a freaking genius and there's people that will completely dismiss what he has to say because he's a mason and i and i and that was a huge you know uh light bulb for me early on that was like wait a second here why is this so harley highly charged why is this you know so hall was a big one and, and it still is today you know he was a guy that would get you into Janine grassi hello we love you so much so, um, yeah, that's it. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, the, I will say this about, and I've actually talked to a bunch of people recently about this, that when you get into esoteric authors and stuff like that, some of them, it's really hard to get at. Some of them, you'll read several pages and you might get one, two things out of it. And the rest, you're like, I don't even know what this guy's saying necessarily. I don't even know if this guy knows what he's saying. But then that's where you go through and you pick out, it's like, hey, what's, what, what can I grasp out of here? What can I take with me? take the best, leave the rest kind of thing, you know? 
And yeah, so- it's like working out or something. It's you, you maybe start a workout plan. It prescribes 20 pushups, but you can only do five at yeah. a time. And, you know, you do however many you can. You try to do the whole set, try to read the whole thing. But things that that's, I think, what scares people off from my show, according to the feedback or criticism I get from people I know in real life who are like, oh, yeah, I checked out your show and I just didn't understand anything you're talking about. So I don't watch. <laughs> you know, there is a point where I didn't understand anything about anything. And I still the more I know, the more I know that I don't know. <laughs> that's the thing. But to me, that's exciting when there's a whole bunch of newness for me to try to decipher and wrap my brain around. I like that. And maybe not everyone's that way. You know, when I was like younger, I tried to read beyond for a very a lot of years. Like even I was like 16, I was trying to read Edgar Allan Poe. And I read when I was like 17, maybe I tried to read um, Dante's Inferno. And I didn't fucking understand any of it at that time. I was 17. Why would I? You know what I mean? But I was trying to. I was trying to read beyond my reading comprehension so that I could understand higher levels of information and stuff like that. You know, new words that I wasn't familiar with and stuff like that. So that's what it takes. You know, esoteric literature is dense. You know, I mean, if you uh, like, you know, I've said this, like, I would like to think that I'm a pretty um, love you. Um, I'd like to think I'm a pretty capable reader, you know, but I, even for me, I picked up Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma and the first few chapters, it was difficult for me. I had to stop, I had to re- reread sentences and that's what really good literature is supposed to do. It's supposed to make you stop, make you think, make you question, make you, you know, S- Draco Jones, your name is not Snake Jones anymore. Fuck that. You're Draco Jones. <laughs> it's way better. It sounds cool. It rolls off the tongue better. Anyway. Draco Jones. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, what's up, Aaron? <laughs> so anyway, people need to do that in general with all of these things. Like you're saying, like this guy, I just didn't understand any of it. Well, maybe that person has no intention of trying to understand things that are beyond his comprehension. But if you're a true truth seeker and a true spiritual seeker, then you're going to do that all day long. You're, you're going to be hungry for that stuff. You're going to be like, oh, I got to know kind of thing, you know? Yeah, this whole conversation makes me think about the differences in people and that well, it takes a lot of different types of skill sets and aptitudes to create a village. And, you know, I, I can't propose to understand why the ancients would do things the way that they did and put myself in their shoes. However, mm-hmm. when we go back to like the Eleusinian, which, by the way, El- Eleusinian people, that's saying they're saying Helios. <laughs> You know, the Greeks didn't aspirate with an H at the beginning. Their H was Eta. So it was just the E sound. So when they're saying, they're saying Heliosinian mysteries, the mysteries of the language of the sun and the sort of segregation of those who are in the know and those who are not, that gets really looked at as evil by today's standards. However, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, mm, I see a lot of benefit to reserving the knowledge to those who look for it and ask because when the mysteries were sort of raped by what becomes of the the Vatican and the Roman empire later on and the, the entry level version of scripture is given out to the people as a hodgepodge, like, you know, bad attempt at synchronous synchronism until they sort of cleaned it up a little bit over the next couple of centuries. The like I see the modern new age is very much like what early Vatican church would have been in the way that they take this syncretized information from many different cultures and mystery traditions, give only an exoteric explanation to the public, Mm -hmm. get people to believe things as literal and historical as part of their whole legal system and entrapment and (laughs) messiah, black magic. Uh, You know, they literally need these things that are astro theology to be believed as history to have the credibility and the legs that they claim to stand on historically for why they have power and other groups and people don't. So I see like the modern new age is very similar to that. People are like, Oh, I like, I like ISIS. That's my goddess. We talk, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like that she's really out there that you're going to communicate with. And, uh, but I don't like, this god or goddess and to me that's not real and it's sort of like just mix and match hodgepodge 
how I feel about it is what it is rather than it having any kind of like deeper truth or meaning to impart on me. It's very fluffy, wishy-washy. I see the early, the early version of the church as we have it now as being similar to that. And that there could be a lot of practical benefit in segregating the knowledge to those who are asking for it and proving themselves like not shitheads <laughs> that are not going to, because the occult is really knowledge of psychology at its root. It's the psychology of the universe. It's the psyche that you're learning about God's psyche because it reflects itself in, in what we call logos through all the words we speak, all the words we write, all the art we make in nature, everywhere you look. Like I think some of those early uh, lodges, if you will, were <laughs> probably trying to find the synchronism syncretism in their own culture. Like, okay, this is what's popular right now. This is what's happening. You know, they're talking about their version of the most popular TV show at the time, if you will. This is what's on at the theater. The goat spells right now, the tragedies are about this and decoding it, if you will, and like showing how uh, it's reflecting nature. Like, I think that this has always been going on, sort of the way that we can decode pop culture and see like, I think to a large degree, not all of it is intentional and that Logos is just coming through and speaking to everybody. But when the dogma is thrown out there, this is it. This is the whole dogma to people who weren't even necessarily asking for it, but they're willing to listen to authority at any point and be like, okay, but it's coming from this authority and it's the collectively deal, collective deal. <laughs> I'm going for it. Like, yeah, sure. I think that's where the danger is. And if it was sort of reserved for people that, uh, you know, if people's religion was just what their families practiced and what they had need for and reason to practice based on their life and their livelihood versus this sort of overarching attempt at a universality, which is what ca one of the things Catholic means mm -hmm. uh, to people who aren't asking for it, <laughs> but are going to just sort of take it as take the exoteric explanation as gospel. Do you kind of see where I'm going at with this? Like, the pos there's some positive reasons maybe for why the knowledge was segregated originally but before things went off the rails at that onset of the Vatican. Um, okay, so I'll say this. When you learn, at least especially the Masonic stuff. Sorry, I'm going to read this. Oh, nice. Cool. Thank you, Dylan. Um, <clears throat> That's from his book, A God's Acre. Yeah, I get a lot of my knowledge about the uh, syncretism of language from Dylan. God's cool. Acre for Winds of the Soul is an extremely good book. You would dig it, Marty. Nice. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um, oh, shit. What was going to say? Oh, yeah. So uh, you have this thing within Christianity that's like that sort of thing that's like, oh, there's knowledge for people, some people, and there's knowledge, and then there's not for other people. That's like really poo pooed in like, you know, modern Christianity, contemporary Christianity, that sort of thing. Right. And yet, those are exactly the words from Christ like numerous times where he said it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but others it is not. I mean, I don't, I don't think you need some sort of special interpretation or to, to decipher what's being said there. You're going to get some information and you're not. Why? As you're saying, you think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing too. Number one, because when you, when you wrap something up into something that is, Oh, look, there's a bird. Hey, come here. Come here. Look at this. Huh? Look at this guy. Hey. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, well, you to flesh out one last part of my point I didn't make, it's just that, like, you know, my dad doesn't know a lot of the script, spiritual, metaphysical stuff I know, but he can fix a car and I can't, or he could do some electrician work that I can't. And so it's okay that we're different levels. It's just bad whenever the, the consensus trance is actually shooting people in their, their own foot. It's... We all, that's just the nature of it. We all are on different levels and there's nothing wrong with that. You're absolutely right. It's not like, well, because I've studied the Bible, that means I'm better than somebody that's fixing my car. Wait a second. What if that guy's not there to fix my car, then I guess I'm not going to get to the next sermon, am I kind of thing, right? So yes, nothing wrong with the different levels. That's how it works. Absolutely. The problem is, is though when you have an organized religion that says those levels that are on high that are actually the inroads to understand the deeper levels of, you know, the, their own theology, they poo poo that. And not only that, they say it's demonic, then that's where you have the issue. And that's exactly what's sort of going on right now. And we have like rigid casts the <laughs> way that India went. And that just gets really ugly too. Like I'm a holy man because of the family I was born into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There are all sorts of issues. 
with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think when you wrap something up in the mystery and then you conceal it, what it does is entices people that are actually interested in learning this stuff to go in and makes them work harder. The idea, and, and this is exactly what masonry does. And I'm telling you 100%, it worked for me. 100%. Masonry was like, oh, what's going on here? We got all this stuff behind doors and all this stuff that you don't understand what it means. And we're not going to say anything, you know? And then it's like, well, what's going on? I got to go and knock. I got to go figure out what's going on. I got to go read the books. And it, it literally pushes you to figure out what's going on. Then when you realize that what you thought was going on was whatever, whatever your preconceived notion was, it was a devil worship or whatever it is. Once that's gone and then you realize what it's all about, it's like, holy shit. That's when you start being like, oh, now I got to keep going kind of thing. It's that's what the whole secret knowledge is there to do. Hide it under lock and key. So the people that are at, <coughs> not every person is going to fucking climb Everest. It's a huge peak up there and not everybody's going to get there. And the whole point of that in this sense, why that peak is there is to get the people, you know, to weed out the people that are actually going to have the fortitude and the strength and the dedication to get to the freaking top. This is what masonry does, except for spirituality. This is honestly what the churches should be doing. Yeah, it's the difference between facilitators and gatekeepers. I yeah. believe the biggest issue that we're facing here isn't that this esoteric knowledge that we're talking about or this logos is encoded in everything and has been universally the root and source of all religions of all time. Mm -hmm. That isn't the problem. The, the thing that needs to be abrogated, as Dylan would say, is the whole middleman, parasitic, vampiric nature of society that is pervasive top to bottom stemming from and beginning with the priest as mediator of your soul between you and God telling you what God said and that you can't connect to God or that you can't connect to the inner Christ. This and is, that's when you understand that that is actually in existence across all levels of the spectrum from lawyers to doctors to whoever it is that's between you and the source of things. And you realize that you yourself built this entire system of middlemen up by accepting their goods and services and giving up the knowledge of how to grow your own garden and giving up the knowledge of how to repair things in your house and giving up, you know, your spiritual knowledge and asking your own questions to an organization. That's the, the real golden key. It's when you realize you can abrogate the system immediately in your own life. And that's as soon as you try to start opening the door to the source of things for yourself, getting responsible for, or learning, how to at least know somebody personally and know what it is they're doing and know the, the whole process without the gatekeeper. I think that that's what needs to be abrogated is this, this gatekeeping. Uh, but that we have to realize we did it to ourselves. We can undo it to ourselves, And it's about the individuals, not about any group. Groups are conceptual. A hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent. And the responsibility rests on your shoulders. And that's the whole thing. And this is what Gnosticism is all about. Gnosticism is, I mean, one of the things of Gnosticism is basically saying that the idea that you need to go to that intermediary, that that mediumship or whatever, you need to go to the guru or the you need to go to Marty Leeds and sign up and pay $54 a year and then you're going to be safe kind of shit. That is 100% bullshit and nonsense. And it never made any sense to me that you would have to go to somebody else to get the, the higher realms. No, if it was for everybody, then God would put it in everybody's hands. That's exactly what he has done. You know, so I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think it's just absolutely quintessential that people understand that their spiritual journey is their own. And if they give it up, even to the idol worship, even to Jesus in this sense, in their interpretation of it, they've they've abandoned that path. 100 percent. They've abandoned that path because it's yours. As it says, you have to knock, you have to ask. And then it'll be open to you. It's not like, well, I'm going to get Pastor Bob over here to ask for me, and he's going to do my knocking. <laughs> yeah, because Pastor Bob's going to lead you to salvation. That's what he's going to do. What? Right? So, You know, one thing I think about in this conversation, uh, you know, like Chance was saying, there's something new coming up. You know, there's a new, a, a new level, a new consciousness, you know, the word we would use is a new church, but that word is, isn't sufficient. A new Cersei, you know, a new uh, path of the shaman, a new 
uh, cure for what ails everyone. One thought I have is like, uh, and we were just saying like, you know, the Masonic lodges are shutting down. There's less and less, you know, places for these private meetings of the minds to happen. Uh, one, th one thought that's just kind of been floating in my head is, you know, we're in a psychedelic age and we've been given the ingredients and the cures to lift up imagination to whole new levels. And there are whole new tools, you know, this is the, this is the new uh, compass, you know, and we have a whole new temple or place to meet uh, that is super etheric. Um, and so, you know, d the fact that DMT is openly spoken about and, you know, uh, trying to be captured, but it's openly spoken about, highly sought after, you know, uh, I think think that a lot of the psychedelic pathway is going to be like, you know, the new, uh, the new seeker, the new answer for those who seek. Uh, so in the chat, you know, you mentioned DMT and I was just dropping, you know, one of my crazy revelations was how much Dante is describing a DMT experience. You know, there's the, the, the souls toiling at the different levels. You know, Which we're really like, talking about the the near death experience, mm -hmm. right? Right. Well, yeah. There there are souls toiling. Those are like machine elves. There's a spirit guide, Virgil, and apparently that's also an aspect. People, you know, come, they find this uh, persona, the spirit that gives them instruction and le leads them through the journey. Uh, and you know, another aspect of Dante, it has those three the three levels. It has the Mm -hmm. uh, the Inferno, the Purgatory, and the Paradiso. Yep. Well, the Inferno, that's the consumption. That's when you eat it. It goes into the, the cistern, mm -hmm. or you're smoking it, right? And that's the Inferno. You're cooking it. And then the Purge is when you blow it out, or <laughs> or if it's, uh, you know, ayahuasca, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> purge out the gates, Purgate, Purgatorio. It comes out of your gates. And then the final the final step is paradisio, where you ascend to a whole new level. And it just blows my mind that we think of DMT as a whole new modern day thing, but it might have been around all the way back in the 1300s when, uh, when Arag what's his name? Uh, Ar Arag Aligari. Yeah. Aligari, when he, when he wrote Dante Aligari, when he yeah. wrote that book. He might have had access to, you know, some some form of it. Well, I think psychedelics have their place, and I actually think that they have a place in a church setting. I think that they absolutely can have their place in a um, whatever ceremonial aspect. The only problem I have with this is somebody that's done a bunch of them. Um, definitely done my experimenting with that. But the problem that I have with that is that ultimately it come, th there's this notion that you have to take something from the external mm. and therefore now, which is not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. Like I said, I've had unbelievable experiences on those things that have actually helped, you know, m in many ways in my own path. But the, I think the problem is, is it becomes people will then just go to that to have that experience. Right, that right. is supposed it's to be materialism. A, it is absolutely. It's supposed to be a tool. Hey, you know, and especially can be. I mean, the idea that that would be poo pooed, but you could have one of the most absolutely mind bending experiences where you absolutely feel you know connected to everything around you. And if that was done in the right setting, that's complete. I mean what an unbelievable aid and tool. But like I said, the problem is, is that then people really like the, my, my, you know, my psychedelic experience is my spirit. You know, it's the, oh, what's his name? Oh, the guy that does the, oh shit. I totally escaping my name right now. He talks all about it. He was like, he does the boner pills with Joe Rogan or something. He, I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. The uh, Aubrey Marcus. Aubrey Marcus. Thank you. I haven't heard, I haven't listened to that guy, but that's his, seems like that's his thing. It's like, he's always trying to find the spiritual angle. He seems kind of MK ultra to me. Like, like yeah. that he was raised in Ultra. Maybe he's trying to be a good guy by the, you know, <laughs> yeah, but, I don't know about him. But, you know, that's, I mean, I, I just, I think that that's a dead end road. I really do. It isn't to say that there aren't, a, like I said, there, it's not like it can't be used or utilized or aids or tools, that sort of thing. In fact, I think it should be. 
in fact some capacities i think it's unbelievably helpful but that's the that's the bad thing that that comes with that is because when you seek out external even the even the eucharist even the eucharist right that's fucking a symbol to tell you that this is in here christ is in here it's not this thing it's like now you take this no it's a reminder weekly to say christ is in you and so ultimately that's what you're supposed to go for but um yeah i mean inner son yeah i think that's why there's a a lot of depiction of the whatever version of the sun deity solar deity it is depicting it with black or in black or how (laughs) krishna Krishna in Hindi means black. Mm-hmm. And that's a very obvious etymological link to the Christ. Other than, as I learned from Dylan's book, the Greek word krestos, meaning good. Which is funny, as he points out, that <laughs> for the the early Roman Empire to start calling their church the Christians, the <laughs> Well, they didn't call them the Christians, but if they call them Christians, but if they had been more accurate to the Greek, they would have been calling themselves Christians or good men, which is exactly what the mafia calls themselves. Good fellas. But what I want to talk about here is like this materialism in the, the materializing of spiritual experiences and shamanic tools, seeking out the external, the psychedelic as the, that being the path itself for a lot of people, you know, businessmen that have spent decades of their life just screwing over hundreds or thousands of people to they go trade bottom to line to of Mexico. And next thing you know, they're they're yeah. again it's like, no, you're fucking not. You got <laughs> 10 years of screwing people over that you're going to have to deal with, buddy. You're not going to go take some DMT. And next thing you know, <laughs> mother ayahuasca and all your sins are washed away. You know, right. And then there's a difference between the uh, ayahuasca that is brewed from one place to another. And I find it interesting, the Santo Daime Church, Mm -hmm. which is a more of a Christian type organization. But like one in Oregon, they're more esoteric, though. And Mm -hmm. they their ayahuasca, they have like rules about how many people needed to be present when brewing their ayahuasca and that a certain number of people had to be in the room praying over it to Christ the whole time. Like there's a, so my point in asking about this or like where I'm going with this is in your exploration of the the literature, uh, maybe some of your thoughts on the, on the more metaphysical speculative side. And the other part of the problem with the externalization that are psychedelics making them your spiritual path or, you know, in this materialistic way is that these are subjective experiences. They're just for you. And even for your own interpretation of these experiences to become concretized and dogmatized in your own life and in your own story, they can become more of a hindrance than a help because ultimately we're not talking about consensus reality, provable things the way that we are when we look at astrotheology or describe what the sun does in different seasons and things like that, that are, there's a correlate to nature. So there's a lot of speculative room when it comes to the psychedelic realm that like maybe one of the reasons why toe Rogan pushes the DMT that he most likely never even did himself, according to people that know him is maybe like some of his handlers that are producing this more synthetic stuff on the synthetic side. Maybe there's a way to program those realms, or maybe there's like hungry ghosts as the, as the Buddhists call it lost souls that are, sort of shuttled into that realm <laughs> to do whatever work on people that go there. I know this gets a little more out there, but mm-hmm. you know, what are your thoughts on all the things I just said? Is there anything in your explorations that have given you a sense of the other side or the near death experience that makes more uh, sense out of it to you subjectively or objectively? I mean, with like, like psychedelics, is it, I, I don't know if I'm exactly getting what you're asking. That's all. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's not much of a question. It's a big oh, okay. ramble, more like. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's a rant, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, as far I'll say this. As far as like um, reading esoteric literature, the um, the notion of coming up on people that talked about, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying my exploration. That was not a big thing at all. 
I mean, like when I would explain, it's not like you would pick up a free Masonic manual and they would be talking about DMT or something like that. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. So, um, but then again, you get into guys like Blake, you know, William Blake and shit like that. And there's, there's a lot there that you're like, where did this guy, you know, was this guy eating some, you know, mushrooms under some cow shit somewhere or something, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, um, but then again, you look at, I mean, I don't know, as just a, like a guy that's been into literature or whatever, you look at the works of uh, James Joyce and that shit's to me psychedelic. And I don't think that guy, I mean, I mean, he probably had a poor pension to drink because he's fucking Irish, but beyond that, I don't think he explored psychedelics and stuff like that. And yet that guy was a goddamn genius. I mean, a genius, you know, next level, you know, to the point that most people couldn't even come close to even understand what he wrote. That's how genius he was. So, and to me, that's an unbelievably psychedelic, but I don't know if he ever partook in that sort of stuff, you know? To me, it's always about, I'll say this. To me, it's always about what can you show me? What do you, what can you show me? So it's like, yeah, man, I went to the psychedelic experience and had this, okay, great. What did you bring back from it? Maybe it helped you personally and that's good, don't get me wrong, or maybe you figured out some things in your life and stuff like that, but when it comes to, helping the general public and um, the humanity and the world and stuff like that understand our position and things like that better. It's like, okay, what did you go into psychedelic experience? Did you take anything out of it? Is there something, did you make a discovery? As far as I can tell, there's not a single one of those psychedelic psychonauts or whatever you want to call them that have done any of that. Most of them ended up being sort of, you know, because they ended up getting into that world and that was their thing. So much of this has to do with image too, by the way. I don't want to be rambling here, but so many people get into the psychedelic world and they're like, I'm the psychedelic explorer, psychonaut guy. But and it can get so hard on your body and then body yeah. and spirit are not really separate. So you wear one down and the other is going to get worn down too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't recommend people to do or not do them. However, I think that like when you're asking the questions, the right experience will show up for you in the right way for you and you'll know what is right for you. Mm -hmm. Like for me, uh, in 2019, I was really <laughs> heavily asking the big questions intentionally and seeking to understand, like I was a, a bit, you know, I was in the conspiracy world, but like a bit floundering in terms of the research I was doing, because the more I studied the occult and metaphysics and esoteric, the more things just seem to be disjointed and disconnected, like too much to know about. And I asked for clarity for a while and was doing a lot for my body to try to generate that clarity, like health wise cleansing and diet changes. And I had this spontaneous experience that lasted a day where for a day <laughs> I went like, I went temporarily insane, they would call it. But for me, it was like a temporary Samadhi type experience, probably not that different than a, a heavy, heavy psychedelic experience where for a day I, uh, understood language completely. I knew what every word and letter and sound meant in like a hyper dimensional way, very hard to communicate with people. And, uh, <laughs> like I had to, a uh, weird thing that happened to me too, was, uh, a Freemason found me while I was in that state and said that he could tell th that I was in that state. And I'd never met him before and he invited me to join. <laughs> and I was like still scared of Masons back then. I still probably wouldn't join a group anyway. But to me, it's like, I don't know. Maybe there are still lodges somewhere where they're teaching people higher levels of perception and sight and techniques for that. And anyway, so I had this like one day temporary enlightenment in terms of the logos and language experience. I couldn't really bring it back when my frequency shift came back to the normal level of reality, <laughs> which I had to sort of make happen because I had to go to work the next day. And I was very concerned about that. <laughs> and after that, um, and I'm used to, at that point, I was already used to interpreting things in my life, external things, the way you would a dream. And that, you know, the outside is always an inner reflection and to not worry about how things happen in the external story, realize it's all about the journey or the, evolution of of my inner world mm -hmm. and uh from that point is where i started getting it i met ran into individuals and, and teachers and, and writers like dylan sakoshio and 
the syncretism started to actually bring all the threads together. I started to see how it all connected. And I'm pretty sure it's related to that experience that after that, as some people new age would call download, <laughs> I started actually making sense. Like the question that I was asking for clarity on about life started to uh, reveal itself. So mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, you know, did you have any moments like that where all of a sudden the, like before you were one way and then afterwards numbers started speaking to you more in a more direct way or, or language itself? You know, those, the, the, the terminology, like the new age download kind of thing, right? That sort of thing. That's Kabbalah. Kabbalah means receiving, meaning like you receive things from other realms, right? That sort of thing. That basically that you are in this sense, like a metaphor, once again, you're a, a, a receiver. And there's some tune that's coming and then you're there to receive it. That it doesn't mean you're always the best receiver. You know, in this sense, you're a stenographer for the Lord. And sometimes we can't type very well. Do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes we're shitty people that, you know, that's all I heard a great melody. And then I tried to play it on guitar and it came out with blah, 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 it was shit, whatever. Right. So that's what that that is. As far as like having experiences with that. A thousand percent. To the point that like there was times where I felt like I actually like physically got smarter because of them. Meaning that was like, I could not only just like understand more, but then could explain it to people better. And that's what it is I'm doing. So even the astrology stuff, there was a time when I was putting all of this stuff together where I had a day where I told my wife, I was like, after, especially after the Noah's Ark one, for some reason, there was that day I remember specifically where my light, my, the, my head felt like the firmament or something it was just fucking lights, dude. It was just like my head was like, like that. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know what, you know, I don't care if anybody believes it or not. I don't give a shit. It's what happened. You know, so there's, and after that, I was like, damn, I really understand this now. I remember the time that I had the first like revelation on pie and it, it, the, what I was doing at the time was just a bunch of stupid math work that really meant quote unquote, nothing in the long run. But the experiences is what set me on the course to do this. And from that point, there was, I would say there was a point I remember thinking distinctly that, and I explain it like this, that for years I had put a bunch of shit in my head right? Years and years and years, just plopping stuff in randomly, all this bit of information here. And I read this from this book and then I listened to this interview. And then after working with Matt for so long, intensely, it was, I remember one day it was like all of a sudden like that and everything in my head rolled next itself to the point where it's like, now, if I wanted to think about something, I didn't have to go stumbling around like a fucking idiot through my head and knocking on doors and be like, was it in here? It was like, boom, I could go Z, K, and just access it like that. And what, once again, there's nothing I can even say to, to prove anything to anybody other than to be completely fucking honest with you and say that that's what happened to the point where I was like, damn, okay, now for some reason I just understand this better and I can't take really any credit for it, none, other than I did the work to be there to receive it or whatever, but as far as, you know, and that sounds probably crazy to some people. Like I said, it's at this point, I just don't care. You know, the proof's in the pudding. I don't know what else to say. You know, it's like when I talk about you go into a psychedelic experience, what can you bring back? Well, I'm bringing something back. It's not the psychedelic experience, but it's like, here's, you know, it's like here's connections that basically people, as far as I can tell, have been waiting for for years and years and years that I have been waiting for for years and years and years. And then, the only thing I can say is I can't take credit for it. And that's genuinely fucking honest. So what, where did that come from? What is it? Okay, well, if you read mystical literature and you read Kabbalistic literature, they're going to tell you it's the definition of Kabbalah. It means receiving. One of my favorite shamanic statements I ever heard was you can do anything in the world as long as you're willing to let somebody else take the credit <laughs> i love that quote, That's such a good quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's good gabriel what's on your mind dude we all want to hear oh man <laughs> well i'm thinking about you know uh i've never done dmt uh and i'm not sure if i ever will 
I go back and forth. I, I'm sorry, can I stop you? I had one of the so just so you guys know a little insight into me. You know the five uh, Mio DMT, five methoxy DMT. You know the Bufo L various toad that you can get oh, it. From? Yeah. yeah, that's a whole different thing than the synthetic toad. kind that most people do up here. Yeah, I, I used to own one of those toads. So. Oh really? Damn. Okay. All right. I'm not lying. I'm not. That's awesome. See, when I talk about like programmable psychedelic realms versus sort of organic psychedelic realms, those two different DMTs are are one of the big things I'm thinking of. Or like that, ergot versus LSD, you know. Yeah. Was that down in Hawaii, Marty? No, it's when I lived in Oregon. I had a, I was, I was kind of going undergoing a, I don't know, not intensely or anything like that, but you know, exploring psychedelics, but not even taking them so much, but exploring them in an intellectual sense. Like, what are these things and blah blah that sort of thing. Not I was, don't get me wrong, but, um, but yeah. Anyway, so I know, I know that stuff. That's cool. Well, my thoughts, my thoughts were, uh, I have done plenty of mushrooms and one in particular time I was with a friend and we did a, a, a menagerie of mushrooms, like three different types. And it was, it was intense. It was super intense. We were going for broke. And one and the thing I learned from that experience was to uh, remove myself <laughs> and to uh to get out of my own way you know and i think uh that's something i tap into when i'm you know getting into that artistic uh frame of mind you know i uh literally see back to that moment you know they say that parts of your own mind shut down uh with mushrooms and uh and i find that kind of scary kind of frightening but i've been there i've done it and uh, it actually can be very helpful. Uh, but yeah, it, it just, it just seems to make so much sense. You know, that's why we call it red pill, blue pill, black pill, like you have rainbow pill, whatever pills. The parts that, that <laughs> shut down Gabriel are the gates. <laughs> What's that? Right? Your inhib it's, inhibitions, right? It's the gates that get shut down in the brain. It's the, um, psychedelics are supposedly bringing down metaphorically the walls between one compartment of the brain and other. Like as you form neural pathways and thinking patterns and belief structures, mm -hmm. some parts of your brain don't talk to each other anymore. There's like, think of it like a, your brain is a labyrinth <laughs> that is built up over time. And when you're a baby, it's just an open flat land where you can see the whole oval. Yeah. And then as you build up your neural pathways, like this labyrinth and these hedge yeah. little maze starts to build. And when you do the mushrooms, it's like somebody just cuts all that down and it's back to full. Everything is connected to everything or depending on the dose, maybe not everything, everything, but it gets more connected. That's too scary for a lot of people. I mean, I get frightened about going into that shit, you know, cause it's just, you know, like you're giving yourself up. And I mean, there's, there's a lot of that that needs to be done. Like, I think you were just saying like, you got to get yourself out of the way. I would say as far as um, my own experience, like, hyper analytical looking over like songwriting over the years or writing anything really that's the that's the process that you're trying to get to is literally getting your stupid like oh it's got to be this and this way and getting it out of the way and just getting into the flow state that is one of the things that psychedelics will you know forces you to do and so for people that are very um bound up that could that's a, a huge help, you know, and what you're saying, I think about the neural pathways and things like that. I think it, once again, it's just spot on, dude, because there, I think, um, getting back to that sort of like childlike state, which is really sort of the goal of spirituality in a sense is getting to that wonderment again is really putting, making those connections back again is putting that left and right side of the brain together so that they're working in a cohesive unit as one, as opposed to being like, Oh, this is, mechanical over here and we're going to be artistic over here and those two can't meet and get that, that sort of thing it's just bust that shit down you know yeah man that's what i love about what about sunday mornings is reconnecting making new thoughts and new new uh paradigms coming together uh you know ever uh i'm not sure when it was i think it was about three or four weeks ago uh i was listening to your program and uh, I started to have realizations that I've been like sharing in my work uh, a lot lately, like uh, having to do with like the constellation Argus or mm -hmm. Artico. 
Argo Navis, yeah. Yeah. And how it's right next to uh, Canis Major, mm -hmm. it's the dog. Yeah. And then we got Columba, Columba mm -hmm. the dove. And they're grouped in right next to each other, all three of them. Mm -hmm. And I was actually, uh, long story short, uh, I was also researching uh, werewolves. And in my were werewolf research, I discovered that St. Christopher is a saint, a patron saint, who's depicted with a dog's head. And now, so, now <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, go on. I don't mean to stop you. Sorry. So, in, so I was just like, my mind was just in the right spot to be listening to your work and thinking about my work and put them all together. And I realized that when you put a ship, St. Christopher and Columba together, Okay. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. got Christopher Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all in the same. I mean, they're just like right on top of each other there. And uh, and then uh, and ever since I made those connections, I've actually seen it in other art. For example, when we did a I pet goat and we saw the, the uh, Christ riding on a canoe with a dog's head on the front of the canoe mm -hmm. is the same thing, uh, just in a whole new format. Mm hmm. So yeah, I love I love uh, making those connections because once you make them, it's like a whole new structure in your mind palace that you yeah, can always I'll, go back and see. I'll throw down a couple of more links. Is just that Christopher Christ Ofer, <laughs> the fur in there is fairy. So it's the Christ carrier, and there's stories about Saint Christopher carrying baby Jesus over rivers and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's Charon, Charon, the fairy man. And also dog-headed, that's Anubis, who's also a psychopomp figure. Uh, even the word carpenter, it comes from words like that re relate to Charon as well. <laughs> it's the car. It's what carries. It's the ferry. Like the the heart, where we get the word cardio, is like also in Latin, the, that uh, the cardia is a hinge. It's like an opening of... Uh, it's a receptacle. It's a, the heart is the car of the Christ within you. It's where it lives yeah. in. There's so much to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, I don't know. The, the astrology thing is so um, nuts because it's, it's insane how many cultures focused on it. Right. Like I, I remember we, and, 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 not, none of it seems at least on the face logical or rational. It's not like there's a big fucking lion up there. It's not like that's actually a dog, right? So immediately what it does is it confronts your quote-unquote rational and common sense mind that says, well, I, that's retarded. There's nothing, you know. And then it makes you ask those questions, right? And so it's like, well, why? Why are they calling this thing this? And why are they focused on these stars and blah, 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 blah. It just gets you rolling in that whole thing, right? I remember we went to one of the things that got me into this a long, long time ago. Once again, was not expecting it, but I was actually with, I think, my dad and my brother. And we were driving and, and my ex and we were driving through um, South Dakota. You guys know the Badlands in South Dakota? Trippy place, man, right? That whole area, like um, the Black Hills and Badlands and then the uh, Devil's Tower. I don't know if you guys have ever been over there, but crazy landscape there. Very sort of mystical, especially when you get into like Devil's Tower and you get into that whole area. It, there's a feeling to it. It's really anyway rambling. Point is, went to Badlands and they had a thing about the um, what was it? The, was it? Is it the Lakota? Lakota, the natives that were there. That was the tribe that was there, and they had a whole book there about this old native Lakota, and the entire book was on their theology, and it was a book called Star Theology. And it was a whole book and it's thin. I still have it to this day, mark the shit out of it. Cause I was like, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? And their gods were up there and they, they tracked and mapped the exact same set of stars. Now they called things differently, right? It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, whatever, it wasn't a bear or I forget what it was, but it was a turtle instead, or it wasn't this, but it was the, but they were mapping and tracking the exact same set of stars to the point, like the exact same constellations. And so I remember going into this and be like, what the fuck? What, what is going on? Why is this Lakota tribe looking up at the canopy of the stars and being like giving, you know, um, personifying or whatever you want to say, putting animal names to these stars and star constellations. Then you go to Egypt across the fricking lake and they're doing the exact same thing. What? That was my question. 
you know, especially as a very highly scientific minded person or whatever, I was like, what is going on here? How can these two separate cultures focus on the exact same thing and then base their divine knowledge on the exact same process? You know, to me, yeah, maybe, huh? No, actually, I think it was a circumpolar constellation. I think it was like Cepheus or something with a turtle. Anyway, I'll have to look at that again. But anyway, that to me was f unbelievably fascinating. I was just like, what is going on here? You know, and then you realize it's because that's a story up there. You know, and when you get into that, you're like, holy shit, God put a story up in the stars. And then that's why all of these cultures focused on it. And it doesn't matter where you go. You can go to Hinduism. It's there. You go to Egyptology. It's there. You go to the Norse shit. It's all day long. All day long, that's star study, you know. Yeah. Ash and Rumbula are fucking Cepheus and Cassiopeia. Jormungandr is that Draco up there. Yeah. The ten, you know, the ten levels around that tree, or that's Kabbalah. It's all there. It's all there. And once you have the tools, and one of these tools, number one is number study, another tool is astrology. Once you have these tools, you put them in your mind. You can look at all of this stuff and make sense of it. Yeah, I mean, They're not completely. But you can absolutely get a foothold like we've never had before. Yeah, I, w I was uh, completely sober, but I'm almost so that. I was almost having a psychedelic experience with the revelation of all the ways we use the word store and star, and how all of the stories are starry stories. Even, you know, Star Wars is like this warehouse of the stories of the stars. And for a whole evening, I was like writing down all the, I don't even know where I put that. It was just taking notes of like all the revelations. Like even we take walk up the stairs, you know, all the ways that just that sound. Uh, it's like a, its own hyper sigil uh, in uh, and this is why it has been kind of inverted or harnessed uh, to uh, generate a lot of materialism. And now people go to the store to gain things. And there's like a kind of a strange uh, mislead that uh, we need things. Uh, so we use that sacred sound uh, to, you know, go in. Uh, achieve or gain or acquire, even accumulate uh, more than is really necessary because we're obsessed with the magic of the stores and the story. That was something to Whole Foods. When somebody was buying a product, we were supposed to like have all of the history of the product all the way down to the name of the fucking dude who picked your corn, you know, and people ate it up. They wanted the story more than they wanted the wares you know, because they were going to go and feed that corn to somebody and tell them about Pablo who picked the corn. <laughs> people love the myth. People's life, we, our lives are myths. That's what people don't realize. Yeah. The corn <laughs> myth is a very foundational one too. It's funny mm -hmm. that you picked corn there. And you're totally right. Before people were going to the store for their food, they were looking at the stars to know how to grow their food correctly. Right. That's for sure. Now, what all this makes me think of, this is just high octane speculation that we've seen some of the talking we've done about psychedelics here, but we do know that the uh, entheogens were a part of mystery school traditions. And I've heard some shamans talk about the astral realm being the original metaverse. <laughs> like it's actually, uh, they talk about the, the astral realm, what we call that, which astral refers to stars, by the way, is an art artificial overlay and i've been trying to puzzle that out and i wonder artificial doesn't necessarily mean evil but it means created right so it means technology also technology and art are very similar etymologically too so i wonder if because when i've been on psychedelics before if i like look at my phone or something uh the letters will do this holographic thing where i'm seeing multiple versions of the same letter in languages I don't recognize sort of expanding out from the one that I'm looking at. And I know that's totally subjective, but I wonder if because the human psyche is interconnected across all space and time, uh, you know, that those things are really meaningless to what we call ether or God or great spirit or source, then every story we've ever come up with and every language we've ever designed 
maybe in the astral that's what makes the astral in the artificial realm of sorts and that whenever you are activated properly to tap into the astral and you looked up at the actual stars at a certain point in history or maybe it's still possible if we could see them we just don't know because we rarely like who's been able to see the whole milky way and been on some kind of entheogen and been aware of the stories <laughs> not a lot of us and i wonder if it's possible to get into a state where you can actually like see the story above you in a, a visceral way you know i i wonder about that if like you can tap into the astral in that sense that is a question of questions i think it really is i mean because there's like i mean okay well i mean then you then you get into like who named the zodiac and that sort of stuff and like the astral realms and like those as far as as far as I understand that those are like archetypes you know that every every an in in the sense that oh god I don't want to get lost in my thoughts here but like you know in in a mystical sense like every animal has an attribute has a quality to it and is is symbolic of something just like the owl the owl can turn its head 270 degrees and it can see at night and okay well why is it smart you know so there's attributes of all of these animals that are obviously up in the the sky the the, the starry skies above and they're like archetypes of the mind and i don't know how else to explain that you know um but that's that's rich in like native american theology where they'll worship snakes and things i mean that's not even you find that in the bible too don't get me wrong but we attribute it to like a native natural spiritual spirituality you know and there's something there about understanding the properties of a snake or understanding the properties of a lion and hence why they put them up in the stars as some grand story you know um that said about artificial that is it's not like there's a lion up there it's not like that's an actual snake but just like our language is artificial in that sense somebody created it somebody it, it's a system we all use it we all rely on it to communicate our world to one another how many people know anything about it how many people know anything about the architecture of every ladder fucking nobody i mean besides i guess some of the people that show up at some of the cha my channel or whatever whatever but um, there's something about going into those studies that illuminates your mind, for sure, that, that brings the metaphysical down to the physical. And I don't know what it is, but I guess that's why it's called mystical. Whoever set these systems up, the system of astrology, system of our language, those two big things knew what the fuck they were doing. They knew exactly what they were doing. And they're way smarter than all of us combined. It is a struggle to even comprehend how someone or a group of people could construct language and myth with so much connection. Yes. But when we look at some things from the ancient world, from a group of people in a time period where they weren't distracted and degraded and watered down men like we are now, just look at some of the, just look at a guy, not even a hundred years ago, Tolkien and write like that guy now, you know, and go back further. Look at, the the epics like we were talking about dante's inferno is anybody writing like that now hmm. but it someone did at some point so i don't i don't put it past human potential to actually have created the languages but i still leave room for the possibility that there's some logos aspect that finds its way in and through and makes it even more perfect and, and beautiful through humans than they could have even intended kind of like an artist that doesn't even realize layers of meaning in their painting that somebody else sees, you know? You're nailing it right there, dude. Because when I say about smarter people, what I'm saying is people that are connected to source. It's connected to God. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not saying that these are people like big brained, little, you know, that's the thing. I'm saying that those people that created this shit were connected to source, you know, and in, in ways that because we're so disconnected, we just can't fathom it, you know? Um, so, you know, and we look at our languages, like, you know, the complexity of it and things like that and how utilitarian it is to the fact that we can even have this freaking conversation right now. And it's like, well, you know, who, who created this thing? I can't even understand it. Then we go and look at all these Gothic cathedrals or, or Tartarian, whatever sort of term you want to couch it in whatever, right? But all these essentially buildings that are all around the world, peppered all around the world. And we can't even come close to as far as we understand, build those today. Somebody did it. So here we have living things that are crafted into stone that completely boggle the mind. And that same sort of level of architecture 
as far as I'm concerned, is in our language. You know, and we use it every single day. And how many people even question any of it? How many people even know what philology means? English is a slave language. <laughs> it's the yeah. same as saying that like... Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I, this is a huge bitching point for me, too, is that all these people come to conclusions like that. That's ah, a slave language. It's manipulation. It's cobbled together. It's a it's a menagerie. It's a cumber, you know, a stumble bum of fucking all. It's a like fucking cuck excuse for like, this is why I suck. It's their fault. I would agree. Yeah. I mean, it's like, no, I would just I would. I mean, our language is fantastic, I think. I mean, I can see why you would initially come to some conclusions like it's jumbled together mess. Okay, cool. But you got to do a little bit more research than that. Our, you know, this the, our, the English language is highly esoteric language. And there's things with, save for fucking gematria and stuff like that, putting numbers to stuff. You could just go in and with certain words and say something else is going on here. Why is silent and listen an anagram for one another? Yep. Why is ocean and canoe an anagram for one another? How was pronounce canoe for me? Is it K N O U? You know, K N U. Why is it spelled C N O E? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Why is it there's only one syllable or two syllables in the word seven and every other number there's only one? Maybe it's because the architects of our language wanted to import to point out the importance of the number seven. Maybe the Bible wanted to do that too when it brought the opening lines and made the whole fucking thing in seven days. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but people, yeah, the, the, most of the conclusions I've heard over the years is that. Yeah, it's a, you know, John D did it and he was working for Queen Elizabeth something something and he was the worship and got his the angels came down and something something something. Anyway. That's yeah. an interesting point there, Dylan. I think it kind of points to their recognition of what nouns really are, <laughs> which nouns are whenever we're using nouns, we're strictly talking fiction, not nature, even if they're useful devices. Mm -hmm. And uh losing track of that has been a big part of losing some freedoms. The other thing is that most people don't realize that it's like they take language so literally, literally, and language is completely one hundred percent symbolic. And what you just said proves that point. Right? <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, um, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's just like you know, a tree. The, when I say the word tree, it's not the actual tree. No, that's the tree over there. This is just some small mouth noises to you to put into your ear holes so we can have a communication about something that's living, a living expression of the divine. Right? I don't know. I think uh, we don't think about it enough. We don't analyze it enough. And um, I don't know. Like I said, the Masons, um, they were the, the, the biggest ones that were holding on to this knowledge for the common man. So that, that someday we go back in and be like, oh, wait, actually this whole book called the Holy Bible is written with this high flown language that's actually there to help us understand how truly, um, you know, connected we are. Cause that's what our language is about. Yeah. I'm, I mean, at this point, it's not even like convinced. It's just like, it's, it's there proving it every single day, every time you work with it, you know? So I'm thinking, I'm thinking about a term that I'm getting a lot of mileage out of, uh, the term hyper sigil. And the term hyper sigil seems like special or unique or that it's highly advanced, but it turns out like even the most mundane things are and serve as hyper sigils. And, you know, I go 30 some years before I find gematria and I realize, holy shit, there's these layers of meaning under what I was looking at under my nose all along. You know, I heard somebody describe the Bible as a hyper sigil once. And I thought that was a, a, a really uh, fascinating way to perceive it. I've also heard it uh, described as a, a library, um, you know, a compendium. I love the word compendium is another great way to describe it. But it's just fascinating that even the little tiny ingredients that are built up to make that compendium are, in fact, hyper sigils packed with meaning. 
you know, it's always like secrets in plain sight. So the stuff is already always around you, and it's just basically like elevating the consciousness. Yes, that's Marty's dad snoring in the background. Can you? <laughs> that's great. The show. I bring the top notch to Chance's show. All right. <laughs> what was I going to say? Oh yeah, supernatural. Um, it's so it's always secrets in plain sight, right? And it's always about this sort of elevate. Uh... Sorry to throw you off, but this is a good comment. Oh yeah, dude. I yeah. Says, oh, Marty should look into ancient yeah, Chinese yeah, because the further it. back you go, the more numerical it gets. That's yeah, how the yeah. agents could understand each other without speech, like music. Yeah. That all the words were numbers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was gonna say. Oh yes, yes. I, I won't. I won't forget this thought. Okay, so it's really sort of this. Okay, number one, secrets in plain sight. It's about uh, elevating your consciousness to ex understand those secrets in plain sight. See them, acknowledge them, recognize them. That sort of thing. Things that you were there that you didn't notice before. Okay, so then you use language like supernatural. Ooh, supernatural. Look at that. What is this guy talking about? Some magical shit? Do you know what supernatural is? Numbers. Numbers are supernatural, period. So here you think something magical, woo-woo, and actually numbers are supernatural. What do I mean? Number, there's not like a num physical number 13 that exists, you know, down the hall over here, and you can go and, you know, just go past the Menominee River and take a left, and there's going to be the number 13. Is there a number 13 in creation? No, nowhere. A physical, material, number 13. Is it anywhere? No. Does it exist? Yes, it does. Right? So what are numbers? They're natural, but they're super, aren't they? Because they're actually not in nature. They're everywhere in nature, but do they physically exist in the singular form of the number? No. It's extra, yeah. So this is an understanding of what we're dealing with. We've been dealt with things like numbers our entire life. Yeah, it's just numbers. You know, or like people say, I like worship numbers. No, I just understand them. And I studied them. It's not like we worship them. Why, why are they important? Because everything I just said is 100% verifiable. No one can deny it. It's not like you're going to drive down the road and go to the physical number seven. Yet this internet... This keyboard right here, your fucking bank account, the bi the building that you're standing, that you're sitting in right now is all based on transcendental, universal, verifiable, axiomatic principles of number that exist nowhere and everywhere. That's supernatural. Now, if you said supernatural and said numbers are supernatural, most people would look like you like you're an idiot. No, I no, think that society no, took no, a bad no, turn no. when numbers became purely quantitative and lost the sense of quality to the numbers themselves. Mm -hmm. You got time for a question from somebody in the audience? Yes, and then I think I have to go. Yeah, we're getting to that two-hour point. Thanks, buddy. Let's uh, play this. I it, guys. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> we'll play this question from uh, Gordy Two Shoes in the chat. He dropped us an audio voice message and our telegram call in line for this show. So it's about 30 seconds. We'll see what Marty's got to think about it. All right. This is from Marty Reed. This is Gordy Two Shoes. Um, I have this issue with this word. This word we keep using. I do not think it means what we think it means. And that word is alchemy. And I don't, Maybe it's just one of those amorphous words that just we just throw around and just redefine it for ourselves. And that's partially true because everything doesn't really exist unless we interpret it to ourselves. And that's what makes it real. Anywho, alchemy, what's your definition? Well, I guess I want to ask, what's his definition? Is he in the chat? <laughs> He's been in the so, chat. Yeah. Yeah. Can we ask, like, because I just kind of want to know where his question is stemming from, because I just want to, I mean, I'll answer it. I'm not, I have no problem answering. But You know, my thoughts that pop up just to see if it adds context and maybe Gordy's thinking this way, to me, I think a, a lot of the confusion of metaphysics has been alchemy and astrology using similar symbols, but not always talking about the same thing. And people trying to, like, line that up when maybe there's not something to directly line up all the time. It should in a perfect harmonious system, but I see a lot of like uh, mistakes made <laughs> and confusion in that and lining those two things up. Let's see if Gordy has isn't popped in yet. He might have had to go. 
Okay, well, I'll say this. Oh, any of the great esoteric arts are going to lead to one thing and one thing only. It isn't to say that the, you know that they don't have other aspects to it or whatever. But ultimately, every esoteric art, every esoteric school, whether that's Hermeticism, whether that's Rosicrucianism, whether that's Freemasonry, whether that's the mystical understandings of Christianity, are going to lead to one place and one place only, and that's salvation. Okay, that's the that's the entire... Oh, does okay, good. That's what I kind of figured you were asking. Does it have to exist in a lab, or does it only matter if it changes ourselves? Okay, there's the, the so there's the question. Okay, I, I that's what I kind of thought you were asking, but I just want to make sure. So, okay, number one, the lab is you. It is always you. Okay, it isn't to say that you can't do chemistry work in a lab or something. That's not what I'm saying, right? Or that won't have analogs to alchemy. No, you know, but there are entire and I challenge anybody that that wants to challenge me on what I'm about to say. I challenge anybody. There are countless alchemical manuscripts, Rosicrucian manuscripts that have literally fucking nothing to do with chemistry. As far as I can tell, they literally have not one thing to do with beakers and vials and measuring anything. Highly, like if you read um, Christian Rosenkreutz or whatever, right, and that sort of thing, crazy symbolic. I would say this, number one, astrological. There's no way you can read that text without bringing astrology to it. I'll just say that. So, you know, when you talk about alchemy, it talks about ultimately that is chemistry of your soul, because that's exactly what every single one of these ancient arts are all about. If you are not transforming your soul and getting and getting prepared to enter heaven, I, then you're not on any sort of spiritual path. So that's hermeticism. That's alchemy. That's Freemasonry. And that's Rosicrucianism. 100%. Alchemy is, you know, Allah comes from Allah, right? I mean, there's different variations that people have, but, and chemistry comes from chemistry. And that's, of course, basically God chemistry. And, you know, and, and when you get into Freemasonry, the amount of, once again, correlations you can make to basically, once again, chemistry, beakers and vials and measuring shit and masonry, brick building, and you elevate and you basically take those quote unquote exoteric ideas, and then you look for the esoteric idea that is common between both of them. It's the search for God in the soul. It is man reuniting with God. That's exactly what it's all about. And I, and I, I mean, I, people would disagree with me about that, but I don't know. I mean, I've done my, you know, I've read Michael Mayer. I've read those Rosicrucian manifestos. You know, go look at Rebus. Go look at the the Hermetic. You know, you could say alchemical illustration of Rebus. Right. Um, Henrik. No, I think it's Henrik Nolius. Is it Henrik Nolius? I believe it is. Right. I mean, it's the you know, it's got all of the fundamentals of your um, spiritual pursuit there. It's the compasses and square. It's standing on the dragon. It's the three and four. It's the egg of creation. It's the seven visible heavenly spheres. It's the androgenine, the man and woman in one body, which is the coincidentia positorum. The whole thing is there. And as far as I can tell, that thing has nothing to do with actual beakers and vials and stuff. So no, I think um, just like masonry, yes, it can absolutely have to do with building buildings. There's no question about that. But is that ultimately what it's about? No. Otherwise, you wouldn't have, what is it called? Um, operative and speculative masonry. You know what I mean? So just the name alchemy, you could also be saying black god because chem like chemet, the black yeah, land yeah, yeah. or uh, chem or ham. In Hebrew, also referring to black, alchem. So the black god would be, apart from astral outside, externally, the sun in winter or the sun when it's entombed below the earth. It's also the inner sun, the sun you can't see. That's what makes it black or, or the dark sun or the hidden sun. And so alchemy, internal as an internal process, black god, Krishna, this is all saying the same thing. The um, Ordo Abikeo, right? You know, the whole, the, um, where's another one? Uh, a star, the, the Seal of Solomon. Same thing. What is the process from the dark, chaotic waters of creation? What sprang forward? Light. Perfect order. The creative force that was, you know, the word. That's what came forth. But first, there was dark waters of creation right? They're, they're even considered primeval or primordial or chaotic waters of creation. That's your spiritual process. You have to go into, and this is the seal of Solomon. It's water, fire, fire emerging out of the waters of creation. This is what order way be chaos. Out of, out of chaos comes order. 
order out of chaos. That's what AB, AB, Cordo ABKO means, right? Order out of chaos. What is that? That's the dark waters of creation that you must go back into to find the order. That's the chaos of this world, the riddles, the mystery of this world, all the questions that you're presented in this world that you that you constant question marks and you go in and you find the order. And that's going straight in. That's the catabasis. That's going into the darkness to find the light. Right. And that's exactly what's the you know, that's that's the the black land. That's the whole bit. A lot of people think it's all like oh, going towards the light shit. No, it's not. No, it's not. In order for you to understand how truly bright the light is, you have to see how dark it goes first. And then when you see how dark it goes, you realize there's a light that's brighter than that. The darkness comprehended not. That's going into the blackness. That's why um, in the Masonic Lodge, this is what all these, sorry, half asses that don't study masonry at all will say. Yeah, they point in the north, it's black. Didn't you hear that? In the lodges, in the north section, it's the dark corner. And that's because they worship Lucifer or fucking whatever. No, it's not, you simpleton. Sorry, I don't mean to be so harsh. But no, that's a challenge. That's saying, go into there. And guess where you're going to find in the pitch black darkness? God, still there. You're going to find the order. So the pattern, the pattern. You'll find, yeah. Vader. So, even Ordo Abkeo. Ab is a word for father, yeah. or is a word for son or light. You know, Do is odd backwards, like the odd in God or Odin. Mm -hmm. uh, even Ko sounds a lot like the Greek Cher, which is a reference to a hand or the car or what is carrying or ferrying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so order Ab Ko is a like sort of in a twilight language sense. Besides saying order out of chaos, is also saying the light. The father of light, <laughs> the hand of the father of light is a way of uh, interpreting that philologically. Mm -hmm. The You know what? We just talked about the Rebus drawing. It's like the you pretty much have the, some of the exact same themes within the double-headed eagle. You just have to look at it in a different, you know, because they're different symbols. But the fundamental core of what they're trying to, the symbolic elements of it, they're the exact same thing. I mean, this is why it's on the cover of Morals and Dogma, you know? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man, we really got you going here at the end. This is great. Thanks for that awesome question, Gordy. <laughs> I mean, I'm not kicking you out, but I'm giving you an out. <laughs> <laughs> I should go. I should. Come back, though. You're welcome back anytime. We'll do this more often if you like. I love doing it live. I love the free flow vibe of this and... Got to ask you about some things I've wanted to talk to you about since the last time we had you on the interverse. So uh, people check out Gnostic Church and Academy that Marty's been doing, the YouTube channel. The Sunday live streams are super lit. Marty is an excellent author. He's well-spoken, but when you see his words intentionally put down and then edited by his lovely wife, it's real good stuff. <laughs> really good writer. For independent publishing, self-publishing, I've read a lot of books that came out through that method and... They don't always live up to the standard of quality that you would hope for in a, you know, a good read. They might have good information and you go through it and you still like it. But like with your stuff, it's extremely well edited, extremely well worded. Could not give higher praise for the uh, newer book, Lord Jesus Christ itself. That one will really help people get what is uh, the big picture of this Logos thing and the math behind it. Thank you for saying all that. I curse like a sailor in my normal speech, but I can actually write fairly decent. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes anyway. <laughs> yeah, Marty, it's been awesome having you, man. And I absolutely love everything you do. I, I, I just hope you keep doing it forever and ever because I'll be, I'll be there on Sundays. I appreciate that, guys. Thank you. Eating Thank you. it up and loving every bite. Yeah, man. We didn't even get to talk secret decoder ring theology. <laughs> I hope you laughed that I titled the show that. It's called secret decoder ring theology. That's okay. We'll do it next time. Right? Yeah, the secret decoder ring. You're going to have to ask ask if you want to receive the secret decoder ring. Send in 1999 to this address, and we'll mail it yeah, back to you. Three payments of 39.95 to Gnostic Church and Academy, and you'll get a box of Cheerios. And then the fourth box might have the decoder ring. 
and then you'll get to heaven. That's how it works. Actually, the decoder ring is an NFT now. Oh, okay. Sorry. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I did these. You don't actually get a physical ring, but you can <laughs> prove your ownership of it on the blockchain. Oh, <laughs> crypto thing. I get it. Okay. Cool. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Gabe, you want to hang back and talk a little bit but after Marty leaves? That sounds good to me. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. All right. Much love and praise, Marty. Thanks for having, yeah, guys, uh, having a great time with us tonight. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Talk to you soon. Later. Peace, Marty. Yeah, that was great to have Smarty Leads on. Love that guy. And I figured it wouldn't hurt to give us a little bit extra time because I'm sure there's some – I'm sure your cup runneth over – over there, buddy. I wanted to give you a chance to maybe empty it a little bit. Man, yeah. I just love the where he's taking things, you know, uh, going up to the heavens and laying out the map because it 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 causes ripples <laughs> that expand and are really making waves in my world, you know. I really do. Uh I was uh kind of I went back before he came on and was like catching up on some of the ones I missed, you know, it's just, it's priceless. And you're right. The, uh, I love that you introduced it to your mother, you know, uh, I definitely, I recommend, you know, like it's a very graceful way to like ease somebody into the idea. Cause it's that, not like zeitgeist where they're like, fuck this religion thing. Look how whack it is. It's obviously all fake. <laughs> you know, he's got right. reference for the material. If you're yeah. coming into it as a sort of, you know, mainstream type of Christian uh, with at least an open mind to hear about it and not call it the devil. You're not going to feel like he's offending your spiritual tradition or anything. He's trying to expand your spiritual tradition, which I appreciate. And, but to, admittedly, I've been working on my mom for months and years on the astro theology thing. And so it felt uh -huh. like a, a big milestone to be able to get her to like, look, and here's the data. Here's more than what I can just rattle off the top of my head. Here it is with Versus quoted and the actual constellations showing you the images and yes. yeah, I love it. Yes. Cause the images really help. Like when you're in a conversation with somebody, it is so limiting that all you have is your words and your, your hands, like actually having the images put in a nice linear fashion for somebody to process it is so very helpful. Yeah. And you're right. That, that regard that he has, you know, that reverence, that he maintains, uh, it is very, uh, you know, it's, it's forgiving in its own way because I noticed that a, almost everybody has, uh, when the subject comes up, almost everybody can say, oh yeah, my grandpa was a Mason. Oh yeah. My uncle is a Mason or I was a Mason once, or I still, you know, everybody knows a Mason, and it can be, uh, there's this weird stigma around it. And, you know, my, my grandpa is, uh, was a Mason and I, and it, that's all I know. That's all I know about it. I don't know what it was about for him. I, that's all I know is that he was in that club. And I think I'd have nice. to go back several generations to find any, I don't know of any, uh -huh. but, uh, there was a long string of sheriffs in my family history. Okay. Like one would a guy would be the sheriff for like his whole life, and then his son would be the sheriff, and three or four generations of that. So I imagine probably some of them were. Yeah, that's further back in like the 1800s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Sharifs. Yeah, it's it's just kind of cool to take away that the judgmental component and to uh and it's almost like it's answering any questions un asked questions that you might have about what our ancestors were doing in those, you know, behind the curtain of privacy. Hey, happy Vulcanalia, by the way. Oh, it's also the day that uh, Soylent Green happened on, according to the movie. The oh. movie took place on August 24th, 2022. I forgot to tell everybody that. That's pretty cool. Holy crap. Everybody enjoy your Soylent Green today. That's what I got in this cup. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Vulcanalia is like a three-day holiday. Uh, I did my last video was on this, and I actually I suspect that they have fucked with the information. Uh, about a year ago, 
I was looking at uh, Vulcanalia, and it said, it, from what I learned originally, it was the 27th. Uh, but now today it's the 23rd, and they've got a new holiday is on the 27th. It's Volturnalia. Vulture Nelia is now the holiday on the 27th when the X of the Analima happens. And then when you read about Volturnalia, V-O-L-T-U-R-N-A-L-E-A, it's a uh, river goddess. It's a holiday to the goddess of the river. And that is just all news to me. Uh, but it makes me think of Amazon, makes me think of, you know, the Susquehanna, uh, the Mississippi, all those uh, sacred rivers, of course, the Nile. Uh, but now I'm thinking... Also makes me think of Nekbet, the uh, Nek Egyptian vulture goddess. Oh, yeah. She was like, she was the protector of the rulers of Egypt. So she was yeah. like, you, you would call upon that Netaru if you were like uh, <laughs> a bad a misleader, a bad leader, and you knew the people were onto you and they're about to come store the palace. Yes. Maybe that's why it's Vulturnalia now. Yeah. Well, well, well let me pause you real quick. I just saw our, our buddy Mike Winter popped into the chat and I'm so happy to well, or tell him happy birthday and I hope he had a great Soylent Green cake. And <laughs> him popping in reminds me that I need, while I've got everyone's attention, let everyone know about Music and Sky one more time. Music and Sky Festival happening in California it's going to be awesome. The weekend of October 15th, right there in the middle of October, going to be an all weekend event. Come camping, come enjoy the vibes with everybody. I'm going to be waving around my tuning fork. You get farm to table meals with the cost of admission. If you want more information, music and sky festival going to be awesome. Promise you it will be both of those things and tribe connection. If you want more information, check out the link in the description of this episode or any recent episode and it's near the top you can even get 50 bucks knocked off your ticket price if you use my coupon code i really hope to see a lot of you there if it's within uh you know a day's drive even it will be worth you know i'll be flying <laughs> it's longer than a day's drive so yeah um but back to you gabriel your thoughts i just wanted to give that advertisement for music and sky festival because i want to see a lot of my friends there nice um well, Cheney was talking about uh, uh, certain Egyptian, I want to say it was, I think it was King Tut, but I'm not sure, but uh, had a, a serpent and a vulture uh, side by side on the, on the head, on the crown of the headdress. And, uh, but so now I'm thinking about this river goddess, uh, Volturnalia as because that is 27th is when we cross over the Analima, when we actually hit the X officially. Um, and so now I'm thinking about Isis, you know, chopping off Osiris because we're at that cutting point, the cutting mark. Uh, very interesting. Also, if you just do one letter switch, yeah, uh, V to B. Which is common between a lot of languages. Vulture becomes bull tour. Bull, bull tour. Holy bull shit. Bull tour. Yeah. Holy shit. So it's in. Uh, oh, man. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow. Yes. Out of that. That's great. Because on the other side of the Analima X, we're entering into Taurus on the other side at, uh, on 415 on tax day. Mmm, bull tour. I dig that a lot. Man, what a trip. So yeah, so it has volt and it has turn in the in the word. So I'm thinking, uh, and it's uh, so Saturday, that's this coming Saturday. I'm thinking that's the perfect day for the powers that love to fuck with us to turn off the voltage, <laughs> you know, to turn off the current, whatever, the current, currency, some kind of fuckery could be happening. And it's a new moon also. All some very interesting things lining up this uh, this weekend. You keep talking. I just thought of a couple of things that I wanted to show you and while I've got you here. So let me pull them up real quick. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I really want to see what, um, what the moon's going to be like on October 15th. 
That's uh, two weeks. That's half a moon cycle. Pretty sure it's a full. Uh, is it going to be full? Okay, nice. So, yeah, it's half a moon cycle away from Mars going retrograde on October 30th, which I heard that's when they're going to be counting the votes for the midterms. Uh, so that probably won't – will be interesting. We'll just say that will probably be interesting that Mars goes retrograde on the night that they're counting the, the fuckery. <laughs> There was a oh man. I'm trying to find it. Still, give me a second. There's mm -hmm. a a story that I really wanted to show you. I'm all right, all searching right. for it right now. It'll it'll be worth it. So um, I know you got stuff to talk about. Sure. Yeah. One thing that I uh, found a while back is that if you look at old cartoons or comics of elections, there's this really strange uh, uh, artifact from elections that was a glass bowl appear apparently is depicted as a glass bowl encased inside of a cube so the, it's like a uh, two flat surfaces this cube it's almost like an uh, half of an hourglass it's a broken hourglass and it's uh so it's got a circle and the square uh intrinsic to the sim symbolism of it but i don't know what that thing is called I just see it in a lot of different comics, and I doubt, I don't even know if they ever used anything that even really looks like that, or if it's just some sort of uh, idea that artists would circulate. You know, I'd imagine that was always just a box, or you know, nothing special. But some for some reason the cartoonists uh, like to depict your votes going into some kind of sacred vessel. So I didn't make it on the weave last weekend, but I wanted to show you this specifically. I don't know if you heard about this, but in Spain, they had a Medusa festival and a stage collapsed and injured a bunch of people and killed somebody. So just wanted to put this on your radar, the Medusa festival. What Look at that. the fuck? That makes so, oh my, there's so much going on right there. <laughs> there's so much going on. This is why I wanted to show you on a stream so I can catch, capture your witness right there. Yeah. There is so much. Not that I'm stoked that people got hurt at a festival or someone being killed, but I mean, they're calling it Medusa Fest, a stage collapse. What's on your mind about that? Wow, man. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay. Wow. For one, this I didn't been know near the beginning of August. Yeah. Yeah. So I did not, so Hydra, that brings forward Hydra, which is a minor decan of Leo. Uh, in Hydra, you cut off one head, another one pops up again. It's very, uh, to be technical, what? Liquid cement pool, so everybody was turned to stone. They fell into a liquid pool of cement? Maybe she's just making a joke. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't what? think that's what. I don't think that's really what happened. If there was a pool kidding. of cement, there I was didn't some, hear that part. There's I didn't some read hardcore that part. Medusa. I think that was just funny. Funny okay. joke. Wow, that's that would be freaky as f. But so Medusa technically is over in Aries. She's like right. She's on tax day. Her her Al goal, the Eye of Doom is overseeing, it's the all-seeing eye, the CIA of the IRS is Al Goal watching you closely to make sure you pay your taxes on uh, 415. Uh, but it does make sense that uh, they would have a Medusa ceremony around August because we have Hydra, and when you combine Hydra with Leo, you get the Yaldabaoth, uh, uh, lion-headed snake, demiurgic being so uh in spain man S spain is like they're so shady they're so fucking shady there's so much shade going around with spain like you know queen isabel her name like we've talked about this is isis and Cybel. not a good not a good look just not a good look <laughs> um Damn, I did not know they had a. Festival. They said the collapse was due to a strong gust of wind. 
And whenever they put something like that in single quotations, usually there's a gematrological significance to that, you know? Oh, wow. wow. So maybe oh. due to a strong gust of wind will bear fruit for you. It is uh 297 in forwards and backwards <laughs> ordinal gematria. It's the same forwards and backwards. It's a palindrome numerically due to a strong gust of wind. So that's interesting. And in September, septenary, it's 101, which is also a palindrome, kind of. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Just wanted to throw that story at you. I have more, but. Damn. Uh, <laughs> B, uh, 297, right off the top of my head, is big. B-I-G. Notorious. <laughs> Damn. That is a crazy article. Thank you for bringing that forward. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into that. Fucking Medusa Festival. I just had to, because I know you're always looking for medusa mother of monsters anything of that sort yes and yeah for her to be in spain uh because uh, we've talked about this but when people hear vatican when they hear uh the catholic church they have been uh directed to think about italy and to think about you know vatican the that that sovereign territory of that building but the original catholic church was all spread throughout it was italy it was spain it was everything in between uh and the jesuits were founded in spain uh, and they have a some heavy heavy hidden roots in uh, france as well so you know for some reason we've really isolated our concept of the jesuits to the vatican building but uh, it even goes out to uh, Malta, to the island of Malta, you know, with the uh, Order of St. John on the island of Malta. Mm. Yeah. There's a lot of talk in the chat about the gust of wind referring to uh, Yahweh likened unto a mighty wind or like yeah. <laughs> uh, wind so wind czars, the Windsors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The wind yeah. czars. That's pretty good. I think it's interesting how the the hieroglyphic for netter, which is the Egyptian word for gods that we get nature from as a word, oh, right, right, is a is like a flagpole with a an erect flag that is, you know, blowing in the wind. No kidding. That's yeah, that's where that word vexelium comes from that I was talking about a few weeks back. Yes. Wow. So that's that's a row. That's the Greek row. Right, which is the P, the Greek letter for P is that flag, right? Oh yeah, yeah. The Greek row looks like that. That's true. Which uh, <laughs> it's phonetically R, but it looks like a P. Yes. Like yes. that's why the monogram, of the Cairo, <laughs> which again, like how how do people not see the he or the he, the Cairo or the he row and think? That that's the symbol for Jesus, and we're not talking about Cairo, like Egypt, or we're not right. talking about <laughs> uh, Charon, Charon, the ferryman. Yes, you know it's all the same thing. It looks yeah. like the X and the P. That's the the Cairo symbol, which is yeah. one of the Christ symbols in Greek. Yeah, that's yeah, man. That's also Netter. Wow. Yeah, that's the hieroglyph for Netter. According to Egyptologists, I mean, they could be wrong about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Well, I guess we'll wrap this up and get on over to hang out with the Flow Staters and Jim Maiden on the Weaving Spiders webs. I would hope to see a lot of you guys out at the Bertaria Festival. If you're near enough to Missouri, Southeast Missouri, that is going to be a great time. I'll be there. It's only not even an hour from my house, actually, which is pretty cool. When is that one? Uh, Labor Day weekend. Okay. Yeah, come out, man. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. I'm about, yeah, I'm about to finish Alonia, up. Alonia major... tent if you need. Oh, cool. I actually, my car is like fully camping ready. I'm going to just... be camping in my car. I just never have yet new car. So I want to try it. Oh, that's right. That thing uh, treating you right? The, the new ride? Oh, yeah. It's so Sm good. Smooth as butter? Yeah. Oh. Of course, Owen's not going to be at his own party, Mike. <laughs> he can't actually leave his uh, farm in Idaho to come to Missouri. So 
maybe next time. Uh, what else is there to tell you guys about? Uh, get in touch with me for sound tuning sessions. Those are going great. Amazing every time. <laughs> and already September is filling up and it's not, we're still a week away. So if it's something you think you want to do soon, please get in touch with me so we can get you on the calendar for a tuning sooner than later. Cause I definitely want as many of you guys to get that, that want it. And I don't want you to have to wait too long. So hit me up and Gabriel, you got any new work to announce or anything in the that's cooking? Uh, well, I just put out a random one, uh, just kind of expounding on something archaics has uh, dropped a long time ago, like two years ago. He dropped okay. this, this random math equation thing and, it just hit a chord, so I had to kind of expand on it with my material. Uh, so, yeah, just a little video there. I'm probably going to really slow down on putting out stuff on my channel. I've got a really big project I'm working on. Uh, I'm thinking I might try to uh, really dial in on the territories and, you know, <laughs> uh but yeah like i'm thinking you know they're doing that esoteric america uh over there with mark and homie Romy and those guys i might try to get my foot in the door with them and it's just been a while since i've ripped through the tarot tories work but then uh i've just got this project cooking in the back of my head it's time to bring it forward and simmer it down and bring out the the juicy juiciness uh so yeah i'm probably slowing down for a bit but i'll be uh gusting on other people's spots uh and dude gustin gustin <laughs> <laughs> the heli gusts yes but i cannot wait for our potential marvelous demystifiers if we can get uh david whitehead on board man Woo! Let's go oh yeah he, well he said he wanted to i just gotta hit him up I haven't be started so planning the next one. It was a lot to conclude Moon Knight. Like, ah, big that was time. a big chunk that we took a bite out of that. Holy yeah. shit. Yeah. But yeah, that'll uh, that'll be a fun one to kind of start percolating. Uh, and it'll, it'll like set the stage for Halloween, you know, getting into some vampires. That'll be fun. Yeah, good point. Well, thanks everybody for hanging out with us. We've had a solid 80 to 90 people across all the channels this whole time. Even after Marty left, he kept hanging out with us. Appreciate that. Oh, nice. <laughs> Way nice. Yeah, Marty was great tonight. He did start off a little fiery, but he, you know, he's a fiery preacher. But uh, <laughs> by, the, by the end, he was starting to have a lot of fun talking about the esoteric stuff. And I like the journey of that conversation. Good times. I hope to have him back again. Yeah, man. Maybe next time I'll ask him, what does it take to keep one of those frogs around? <laughs> Fobu frog or whatever that was. Yeah, let's uh, get a little bit more of a lesson about that for sure. I'm sure he has a lot of good life experiences. I love Marty's work. I do authentically mean it when I say that I go to his Sunday morning sermon live streams every week. Not kidding about that. And uh, his books really are very well written. And, it, you know, Maybe there's a not a hundred percent overlap in how we see things in terms of secret societies and masonry, but I really respect his opinion as someone who's read way more books by Masons than I have. <laughs> I really respect the opinion. And I think it doesn't help us to boogeyman uh and paint with a broad brush most groups. I mean, if anybody is deserving of it. Jesuits are a good example of deserving of it, but there have been Jesuit authors who were not, who were giving good information or seem to have noble intentions. You really just can't operate on that whole group mind, either being part of a group mind or painting everybody as a group mind that has a label that you gave them. Just doesn't work that way in reality. Uh, discernment on a case by case basis for sure. Yep. Yeah. So. Alpha Warrior says he references Lord Jesus Christ as, all the time as a book. Yeah, it's a really good book. Okay, guys. Well, we'll we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. I think that's a good point for it. Next week we're gonna do iPet Goat Two oh, Two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I look forward to connecting with Joshua and Andrea and you and finishing up that fun stream. We're gonna have a good time. 
Yeah, man. Excellent. All right. Be well, everybody. Much love. See you guys soon.